actually on Twitter. And uh, we should be live, and uh, hopefully somebody's watching and can tell me if the stream looks okay. Uh, I will take a look. I will pop over to Twitch as well. Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, I can see everybody. Hi, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, this week's Geek and Greet. Hello, hello. That looks like we're doing good. Okay. And almost no latency. That's good. Hey. So I recognize some of the faces here. <laughs> yeah, can we have introductions? <laughs> Deja vu. Well, uh, we should start. Yeah, well, please go ahead. I'd say let's start with the host. Uh, our host tonight is uh, uh, Kit. Hi. Uh, OK, so if we're going to start with me, uh, my name is Kit. I am the CEO of Fools Moon Entertainment Incorporated. I am a game writer. Uh, I'm a, a st short story writer. Um, I specialize in the mechanics. I've created like now four game systems, three of which we're publishing, uh, two of which are going to be OGLs. Uh, that's strange. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I'm the host. Uh, I'm glad to have you all here. I'm sort of the co-host. I'm Rezo. Um, I own, uh, co-own a uh, tabletop gaming uh, store location down in uh, Florida. Uh, I've written a little bit, but uh, nothing's really published and nothing's really set in concrete. Uh, but I do love uh, GMing and playing and role-playing games. It's pretty much my life. Uh, all right, I'm up, I guess, top left. <laughs> If I'm top left on your screen, I'm Russ, a.k.a. Salty uh, of Salty Games. Um, I wrote the game Nuedo, which uh, came out, was we ran a Kickstarter in 2021, did a little bit better than I was expecting, got to spend lots of money on art, and um, is growing fantastically well, uh, way better than I could have imagined. Um, and we're about to launch the first iterative tech, uh, Kickstarter in a week or so for the first official expansion. Nice. Hi, I'm Anya. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm just used to saying them on streams. So um, I write a lot of stuff. Uh, I'm Lolly on Cosplay Everywhere. Uh, for my writing, I am Lolly on Publishing because consistency. And I have written a lot of different solo TTRPGs. Um, and my new one, which is a one to two player TTRPG, is The Apothecary's Apprentice. And it's coming out in two days on Kickstarter. I'm very excited. Excellent. Smart enough to bring print publication to the stream. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I brought these with me to MCM London, and I have some left. Good. <laughs> Yeah, Rez and I have been talking about a checklist to have uh, for people uh, for our guests. Like, okay, do you have any images you want us to show during the stream? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think I'm last. So my name is Michael. Uh, I am uh, the host of the RPG Academy podcast. We've been running for like 13 years now. It's kind of wild to think about that. I uh, I've only have one game that I've actually written to completion. I went through Kickstarter and I just put in the order to get it printed. I have the proofs coming sometime soon. Hi. Awesome. Exciting. It's Very called cool. Action 12 Cinema. It's a gameless game about bad movies. And then <laughs> I also um, am the lead organizer of a gaming convention called a Catacon. This is our 11th year, and it's actually this coming weekend. So I got like three more days to freak out and try to get everything organized. Um, and it's just a small, it's like three to 400 people, very RPG focused in Dayton, Ohio. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. I used to live in Ohio for a couple of years. I'm about sorry. seven, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering why your accent sounded so familiar to me because I grew up in West Virginia. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm from Southeast Kentucky originally, lived okay. many years in Ohio. So my, my mm -hmm. accent has definitely softened. But if you're not hearing a lot of it, it will twang it a little bit. Yeah. But I might here. get some of my accent back because of this. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, Anya, I have a question for you since uh, you. Yeah brought up uh, your Kickstarter. Okay, so you said you write solo and uh, you're doing a two player, one or two player game. Um, yes. I've been very curious about solo RPGs. 
Uh, like mm -hmm. I like the, I like the idea, you know, just something to kind of pass the time and stuff like this. Um, how do you do social mechanics in a solo RPG where you want to talk to an NPC, <laughs> but you don't want to be the person who dictates how they act and how they respond and what comes up? So that's an interesting one. Uh, and it really, really depends. Like my first solo game is called Mountaintop Isolation. And that one, you are isolated. It's a wretched and alone system game. You are the only one in it, except for the spooky things that are happening around this isolated mountaintop. Um, so that one, there's no <laughs> interaction with NPCs. Unless you know you find a note in your pocket from your friend you were supposed to meet. And you're like, where did that even come from? Uh, start talking to yourself. <laughs> that too. But um, for example, with uh, the Apothecary's Apprentice, um, I have um, the mechanics of it is that uh, for the customers that you get, you're, you're the potion maker's apprentice, essentially. And uh, there's uh, just a simple deck of cards table for the uh, customers that come to call. And uh, you can be as descriptive or not as you want. It is... Uh, in essence, a journaling game. And mm -hmm. so uh, you can play that how you want. Uh, the artist for the game, Ghost Candle, uh, just did a play test of it on stream. And the way they did it was that they were playing all of the characters. Mm -hmm. So, And I was very shocked at how distinct each of the characters were uh, with that. It was really cool. So that was very much a essentially talking to yourself kind of thing. But it can also be a situation of just thinking about how, like if you're given uh, the baker who wants a venom heart potion, well, why is this baker heartbroken? Uh, what is the reason why they are trying to get this uh, terrible potion that's going to ruin the life of their ex-lover? <laughs> And so uh, it's more of a an introspective, like, writing game, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you have an, a second player, then it's more, like, interactive. You're both the uh, apprentices together trying to uh, work together and figure out what's going on. So I think that helps a little bit in that social interaction. Okay. Yeah, because, like, when I play RPGs, uh, like, the adventures, the dungeon crawling, the fighting monsters, those are, eh. Uh, me, it's like going into the town, talking with the NPCs, making contact, mm -hmm. making friends, and seeing all the weird things that start to crop up. And I have not seen a solo RPG that can handle that part of the thing. Yeah, it's a little bit tricky um, because a lot of solo games, you need to have oracle cards. Uh -huh. So that's basically uh, the deck of cards will tell you what happens. Um, and so from that, you can get some of the NPC interaction. Like maybe there's a, a quote, something that someone says to you, something like that. And those oracle cards can be anything from literally just one line um, or it could be like a full page description. Uh, a little bit more like choose your own adventure, I would say. Yeah. <sighs> okay. <laughs> well, that answered that question. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope. <laughs> you know, I, you know, obviously, there's different types of RPGs, and they do different things. And I would guess just basically that in the name that a, a solo RPG is a game that you're not, that's not really what you're trying to get from it. Like, if I have three yeah. friends, I'm going to play an RPG, you know, because I have the three friends. But if I don't have them then I might do the solo RPG type of thing. So it's, it's probably just like apples and oranges in a way. I'm sure there's there's a way to blend mm -hmm. it, but I would just think that's probably, I mean, if you can figure out how to do it, you might mint your own money there, but it seems like that's kind of like two different things that you're trying to accomplish there, I would think. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think it is doable in a certain way, uh, but not not all of them can do that and not all of them are meant to do that. Yeah. Like, I, I've done the solo RP using uh, AI Dungeon, and for a while that seemed to work out fairly well, then something happened to the AI and it went south. So I was like, well, so much for that. It gained sentience and tried to kill you. <laughs> yes. So, running a gaming convention, you said 11 years? Uh, yes. Well, our numbering system is a little bit uh, unusual. The first two were actually in the same year, and they were both at my mm -hmm. house. Um, and then we went public. <laughs> Um, and then we also skipped a year because of COVID. So it's like, there's like four different numbers. So there's like 11 year, 10 actual events, nine uh, public events, if you know, but it, we just say 11 and move on. Five golden. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Um, so wait a minute. You said two of them were inside your house. Yes. So that's how they started. They were just basically, uh, you know, a grandiose gaming weekend with some of my buddies and my friends. Uh, we had already started the podcast. And so this, so, okay, long story short, I went to Gen Con for the first time ever. I had never mm -hmm. been to any convention before, not just gaming, but just period convention. Mm -hmm. So my first convention was Gen Con, which at the time was around 60,000 people. And it was like a life changing experience for me. I absolutely loved it more than I could express. And I'm on the way home. I'm talking to my friends. I'm like, okay, I can't wait a year to do that again. And a smart person would have like Googled and figured out, hey, there's like 3000 local conventions, but no, I'm the guy who makes my own. So we just basically threw together a little, like everybody come over to my house and we play games. Uh, and it was so much fun that we're like, okay, we want to do that even again, again. And then, then we just put it out on the internet. Like, again, we were podcasting at the time. I'm like, hey, anybody wants to just come to my house, you can. And people did. Like, I had people drive <laughs> from Arizona. I had no <laughs> idea who they were. Uh, it turned out to be great. Okay. But, uh, you know, I'm like, uh, this is a little bit weird. So maybe we should take it outside my house if we're going to have random people showing up. And so it was suggested that we like everybody throw in 50 bucks and we just rent like a ballroom. Instead, I went to Kickstarter, raised several thousand dollars, rented out a lodge, and then it was born mm -hmm. from there. So uh, it's still tiny, but it's absolutely so much fun. I just, it, it, I can't hardly express how much fun I have putting this together. Uh, again, anxiety inducing, but still exhilarating at the same time. Yeah, my first well, convention- the cons can also be really fun. Yeah. Sorry. But no, yeah, no. My, uh, the first convention I ever went to was in a library basement, uh, and it was the first time I ever got to play AD&D, uh, because I was only doing the red box at the time. Um, the second convention I went to was uh, Can Games, which has been around in Ottawa since uh, I think it was like 1974. And uh, unfortunately, it hasn't grown since 1974. <laughs> like uh, they're not trying to do anything new it's always at the same curling club which does not have enough space mm -hmm. uh they don't advertise as much as they could they don't try out any new things there's no game panels or stuff like that and it's every, like you, you go there you recognize everybody from the last five years right there's almost no new blood coming in and i'm like i want to see more in this convention there's so much more that they can do um, I mean, there was a few companies that actually have tried to come in and, you know, sponsor and try to generate interest. Nintendo went in once. Wow. Um, oh, wow. Never came back. <laughs> um, and uh, a couple of years back, I was talking with my former partner in the company. I was like, we could run a convention. There's like this like fully furnished curling hall just down the street from where I live. And it's like a lot of space. It's very vast. And we could do this. And nothing ever came of it. But it I'm is gonna... a ton of work. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's, yeah. But it's also, I like think of it like kind of like batteries. You know, you have double A, triple A, C, D, car batteries. I, my convention will never be like Gen Con. Like if, if a thousand people show up this weekend, I will die. Like I will just have an anxiety attack <laughs> and die. But I would like to get to like 700, 750 people, like mm -hmm. outside a thousand. I think if we get bigger than a thousand, it's, it's not, it's not, it's no longer what I want it to be. But yeah, I'd like to get to like 750. So we, we are trying to, to grow, but slowly. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just sort of like, uh, like in a small Gradually. process. Gradually. Gradually, that's the <laughs> word. Thank you. Gradually get to a point where it actually self-sustains and we don't necessarily have to go to Kickstarter every year and beg people to help support mm. what we're doing, you know. Uh, we're not a nonprofit. We're just not good at making any. So if we break <laughs> even every year, we call that a win. You're a technical nonprofit. I'm, exactly. I mean, I'm a <laughs> not <the> profit. <laughs> yeah. That is the question. It's like, how do you uh, generate money for a convention? Uh, how do you weigh it against the cost and stuff? Um a friend of mine actually uh she was starting up a convention and like she's like well you've been to conventions what do you know and i'm like okay so you know this is uh what you want to do is you want to figure out how much your costs are going to be uh go a little bit highball on that then you you split that up by about how many people you want to attend that will tell you the average price you want for people coming in and then mm -hmm. you know you build up from there so um well, the thing is vendor fees what you charge yes. your vendors for for renting their space yeah right. yeah but then you have to weigh that against how many people are going to be there. Like I've only had like we're we're hoping to have like 500 people this year. So what is that worth to a vendor? You know, I know mm -hmm. that my fees are pretty low, even considering mm -hmm. how many people we have. But I do that by design. Like I'm I want them to have the best weekend ever, so they come back because it's easier for me to just say, hey, you come back again, rather than having to go out and find 
more people or new people every time. So we have a pretty yeah. solid return base. Like we have a few new people every year, but for the most part, there's like half to more are the same people that just come back every year. Yeah, I think oh, we, that's really uh, nice. Yeah, we actually uh, had a booth at Can Games for about four or five years straight. And I mean, at the most, we'd usually have like six customers over three days. Mm -hmm. It's not worth it. Uh, and a bunch of the other uh, vendors have pulled out since then. Mm -hmm. Uh, like there's uh we have like a really big comic store here in ottawa um called um the comic book shop and the the book has like an uh, no the shop has an e on the end type thing. oh the shop mm. yeah um <laughs> and um like they had would they have a huge booth there but no they stopped um the only one that that i know of that stays there is blue griffin and they're the ones who buy all the old retro rpgs like they have uh, some of the oldest mm. stuff available the price is a little high, but if you're looking for something, they probably have it. Yeah. That's where I got my D&D Cyclopedia. I think there's a bit of an art and science similar to like a Kickstarter, like trying to figure out, you know, what should your goal be? What should your stretch goals be? You know, all the different formats and offerings. And there's it's sort of a similar thing with vendor. Uh, just again, for my example, most of our vendors are like nerd geek, um, like custom made like crocheted pokeballs and laser printed D and D character. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's hit or miss. Uh, last year we didn't have, I think we only had one store that was actually selling like game stuff and it was pretty limited. And we have people say like, I went and played this new game. I wanted to go buy it and no one was offering it. So like we tried mm -hmm. to say, Hey, if you were selling like retail, that actually might do a pretty good job here instead of the other things. And I know one year we had something came with Funko pops. Like that's all they had. They did not get one customer the entire weekend. Like there's just oh, that wow. wasn't the right product yeah. for what we do. Yeah. How many how many vendors do you have? Uh, thirty. We have thirty vendors. Oh, okay. Holy crow! That's I think uh, Ken Games has like six or eight. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I, the last Ken Games is where I got New Edo. And, yeah. and so, and and that would have been. I think. Did you get that from? Um, uh, um, oh, jeez. I was at Ragnarok XP in Guelph. And met a team who started distributing New Edo for me, uh, but at a loss. So I, I will tell doing you exactly that. what your name is in a moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I apologize Open for failing tab. on that right now. But my experience <laughs> at Ragnarok was I haven't been to any big ones. So I'm I'm uh, in Canada here in southern Ontario near the falls. Compost Dream Games. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, it's so a lot of I, I met a, a very kind gentleman who said, "I like the look of this book. Um, can I sell it for you?" And we talked briefly about that and, and the, the physical books had just come out uh, and were just mm. being shipped to my Kickstarter backers. Um, and he said, you know, this will do great. I'll take it around the country for you. I'll take my cut basically the same as a retailer. And, yeah. and, and I don't know how he makes any money doing it, but he had a big table of beautiful games at this Ragnarok XP. At well, which he I sells it to retailers for one thing. Well, he, yeah, he did. Um, and, and, and that's how I lost a bunch of money. Um, but, <laughs> mm. uh, but that, that's not his fault. That's my fault for printing too few of them and having a too high unit cost, uh, mm -hmm. the joys. Right. But, yeah. um, but he walked away from that con with a box of my two boxes of my books. And it was this, ah. uh, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm completely new in the space. Didn't know what to expect. And, and, uh, my wife sees me loading or, or hears about me loading two boxes of book into this guy's truck at the end of the day. And she's like, are you going to get any money for those? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and, and and they did all sell uh, for less than wholesale rates. So it was a, a not an experiment I've repeated. But again, I would love to take better advantage of it in the future. Round, rounding back to the con, everyone was selling books. It was about 50-50 book vendors and Chachki vendors. Mm -hmm. um, and lots of little indie game developers too, like me. Mm -hmm. um and so and so i had a ton of fun there the chachkis did okay but the games like i sold out of a box of books and nice. and stuff like that so it's a definitely um a, a great way to get eyeballs now on the the time per you know your dollar per hour kind of return is negligible but that's the way the business works <laughs> yeah so yeah. And then was it fun to get out and, and, and have a table full of my crap and people come over and ask questions <laughs> about it because when they find it kind of organically through the internet, through Kickstarter, through friends, through referrals, whatever it may be, they know what they're getting into a little bit. Like, oh, it's like uh, Legend of the Five Rings meets Shadowrun, right? I like both those games. Let's play this. Or I fucking hate one of those, pardon me, one of those games. Uh, so, Where's my bleak button? Yeah, sorry. I apologize, apologies about that. Uh, but when you meet someone at a con, they just walk up like, what's this sell me on your game and yeah. you get to do the sales pitch and everything like that from scratch 
Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a whole different experience, and I had a lot of fun with it. Plus, I got I didn't play a Nuedo. I played a like I also wrote a kit bashed model skirmish game just for playing with robots, and we played that out on the tables, and that was a ton of fun. Yeah. And that got a lot of attention, but I still gave that one away for free, so the the profit margin is terrible. Oh, I did that. Um, funny story. When I lived in Calgary, uh, first day learning wrestling at high school, somebody suplexed me, knocked the wind out of me, and I had to walk over to the walking clinic. So that winter, uh, my gym teacher dressed up as Santa Claus in front of an assembly and started calling people down to give them Christmas presents. He called me down and he gave me a 30 pack of the little plastic muscle anime uh, action figures saying I needed a bodyguard. Two days later, I wrote a role playing game on that. Mm. Nice. Yeah. And when I went back to Ottawa, I sold the role playing game plus all the figures for about 20 bucks. <laughs> so, yeah, I. That's where I was like, oh, you know, I think I have a gift for, you know, writing mechanics yeah. and I make role playing uh, you, games out of anything. You went to wrestling, but you learned capitalism. So it's like an economic <laughs> class. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, uh, it was interesting because when uh, I was at Can Games and uh, Compo was doing games, I, I walked by their place and it's like, oh, yeah, they got my stuff. And I see New Edo and it's like, oh, it's Japanese. So that has my interest. So what is this? He pitched it to me and like, I don't have the money right this second. I'll wander around a bit. So I wander around, came back and looked at it again. It's like, He's only got the one copy. Water around, come back. <laughs> That's calling to me. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> well, I'm, gl I'm glad you did. It's worked out great. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need to try to get my uh, my RPG group interested in it because uh, I really want to play it. Mm -hmm. Well, you had asked if I could ship you down a box of books for your store, right? And uh, getting I back to the woes, because I'm up here in Canada in a small town, shipping across the border is brutal, and my per unit cost is astronomical because I only printed 400 or something like that. Yeah, and uh, so I can't even retail locally without losing money, and it's a yeah. little bit like ah, I've clearly fucked. Pardon me, screwed myself up a little bit here. I'm oh, sorry, I'm not accustomed to this. Apologies. Um, and, and and you're a but, sailor. Yeah, it's it, 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 me. It's it's in the name. Out there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's actually on the back of my book. The warning says this is a generally positive book. There's no there's no bad shit in here, but I swear a lot. So <laughs> Truth in Africa. Yeah, uh, well, I love it. Sure. Yeah, oh. I, I still would love to get a box of your books. Unfortunately, we just expanded and uh, we're broke right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean. It'll, if it's on the next print run, I might be able to get them down there for a lot cheaper if I can uh, get a get a larger print done. So, do you um, mind if I ask what your per book is? Because I'm I've just now put my order in for mine. I'm just curious. Uh, what I'm paying to have them manufactured? Right. Yes. What you're mid mid thirties Canadian. Ooh, and it's local. Very high. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now that's Canadian dollars, so it's like six freedom dollars or whatever. Okay. But. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. See, I came it's funny you said I heard early. an eagle screech when you said that. Did, did everyone else hear that? Or was it just me? Yeah. Uh, I came oh, I this too early because when I made uh, Fox Magic, uh, there was no such thing as print on demand. Uh, Drive through RPG was only doing mm. PDF. Uh, we got a print run out of uh, Toronto and to actually make per unit effective, we bought, uh, we had five thousand copies printed. It took Holy us moly. about. Uh, it took us about 18 years to sell them all. Mm. <laughs> well, and you had to prepay for that. Yeah, so we had to. Pre My mom basically lent me like you know eight thousand dollars to do this. I mean, that still sounds like a good unit cost. This, this yeah. print run cost me thirteen thousand bucks. Yeah. Uh, wow. And now Kickstarter had paid for it, right? But now yeah. I'm coming to the mm -hmm. end of that fifty or forty books downstairs, and I sell a handful a month. And the question is, can I reinvest twelve grand right now on a on a hope hope I sell more? And then I'm still paying mm -hmm. that $30 price. This has kind of become a tangent. Yeah, we didn't even have Kickstarter. The, yeah. the, I mean, we were doing this old school. And don't get me I, wrong. Like, I'm not, like, I'm all for printing where, wherever you are locally, but there's got to be a way to print that cheaper overseas. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Impressa out of Lithuania is what everyone says, just go there. Even after you put it on a boat mm. and get it across the, the pond, okay. you'll still be cheaper. Mm. Um, and so I started putting feelers out, but I talked to a couple of folks in the States that said, don't even bother trying to print here. Um, uh, Studio Two, they're a distributor. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, no, nobody makes anything in the US anymore, Lithuania or China. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And Impressa huh. has a very good track record, good quality. I don't know what the per unit cost would be. Um, I guess shipping is the bigger thing, but then I'd probably leave half of them in London and bring half of them over and store them and warehouse them somewhere in the States uh, because 
anyone that buys my book not in North America, they're paying 55 Canadian for shipping. Yeah. Which Ooh, obviously yeah. Impacts, like lots of people just say, no, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm not going to do that. And I'm always right. blown away when somebody will pay almost the same price of the hardcover book for shipping again. Yeah. And, you know, thank those people profusely. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question those for you. Those prices um, always shock me. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, do you have a print on demand on uh, drive through RPG? No, I don't. Uh, I wrote the book in Word and laid it out in Word. Mm -hmm. And it's not print-on-demand format ready. Uh, so this has been something I've been fighting with for two years now to try to get somebody to convert it effectively to a POD format. We have three uh, people who could probably help you with that. I would love to chat with them. Um, okay. You know, it's a 308 page book, so that's what, 3,000 bucks for me to do it. Ooh, yeah. Probably three to $5,000 to convert. And, yeah. and am I going to make that back? Yeah, because the thing is, what we do is uh, we use DriveThruRPG for uh, if we're going to have sellers in the States. We do the print run of, through DriveThruRPG's print on demand, have it shipped directly to them. It's a lot cheaper. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. I screwed myself by by doing layout myself. Now I'm happy with how it turned out. Well, that's out. what I did with Fox Magic, so I know exactly that pain. But, but yeah, yeah, I do my nice. layouts too. And what do you use for it? Word. <laughs> do you? I mean, like, it's yeah. a lot. Google Docs. Yeah, I mean, Word is a lot more versatile than people will give a credit for. Now you really have to fight with it. Like, yeah, Word Perfect yeah. actually was how I did Fox Magic, yeah. and nobody uses Word Perfect, which is a little yeah. bit sad. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. when I grew up. Word Perfect was my bread and butter. I, the, the the novels I've written that no one will ever read were all. In Word <laughs> yes, but exactly. I, I have to believe that that layout, that getting it converted, cost is high there too. Like I, like obviously talk to them, but if not, talk to me. I have a person I think can do it much cheaper than what you're thinking. Well, okay. I know that the most recent edition of WordPerfect also allows for ebook publishing. You can actually have it set up in the WordPerfect document and it will convert it to the proper format. I just don't know how to do that. Okay. <laughs> I have a friend who it's, uh, uh, publishes his own stuff. He, uh, he, he He's a scrivenger. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that one. Scrivener, I think. Scrivener. Oh, yes. Scrivener. Yeah, so Scrivener. Yeah. Yeah. Or I've only heard him say it a couple of times. So. Yeah, my wife's mm. learning InDesign at the moment. Mm. Yeah, I had used InDesign in the past, but like I told you all before, it's on my very, very old laptop that takes about an hour to boot up when I plug it in because mm -hmm. the battery dies like that. Yeah. Uh, so easier to not use the app that constantly crashes on me when mm -hmm. I try to use it. Yeah. I have a copy of Publisher, which is the cheaper, slightly less functional version of InDesign, I guess. Um, mm. And one of the, my potential solutions to this was to get someone to set up a series of masters in in mm. Publisher, and then I could import all the layout. They basically, you know, drive me to the lake and then I go learn to swim kind of thing rather than me have to get there yeah. all the way myself. And that could probably work. It's just a matter of finding the time to do it. Oh, uh, yeah. There's mm -hmm. that. And it's so do I spend another 100 hours doing that, uh, which would serve the community well because then it's POD and cheaper and all of that. More of my books would mm -hmm. get sold. Yeah. Uh, or do I create iterative content, which everyone's clamoring for, which is a good problem to have, right? <laughs> um, so at the moment, the, the, the answer is more content. Um, but at some point, I mean, the, that's because I've got the luxury of having a couple of boxes of books left in the basement. Right. And when those run yeah. out, it'll be compressed or crunch time. Like, okay, I still want to sell physical copies of the book. I'm old school. I love having the dead tree version. Yep. Yes. Uh, and and the game is a little bit old school as well. So it probably its target audience wants the old school dead tree mm -hmm. version. So I still great. think with those shipping costs, I think getting a PDF copy, you would get some income for that. Because all those people who are like, I can't do double cost shipping would probably do a high value PDF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we actually just cracked gold tier, gold best tier on drive through RPG, nice. which is kind of cool. Um, and and if I had been smart enough to set up my Kickstarter so everyone had to pay a buck when they download from Kickstarter, it would have been platinum already. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that, that, there's a lesson learned for my next one. I'm not sure actually what the audience will feel about that, but I would like to have the next Kickstarter say, whatever your goal, your tier is, keep in mind I'm going to charge you an extra buck on drive through RPG, so just so it counts as a sale. Mm -hmm. drive through yeah. RPG will take most of that from me, and I don't oh, care. Yeah. It's more just to have mm -hmm. it because then that drives their algorithm, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So this is where you're supposed to pitch your next product. Well, I mean, am I supposed to pitch my existing product, my old product? What do I do? Well, uh, you have this one that's coming up that I was f uh, fairly interested in. Okay, so actually, it, it, Nuedo is, uh, like I said, a, a combination of Legend of the Five Rings and Shadowrun, but without the latter's very crappy systems. 
Um, it is a old school crunchy uh, RPG, trait plus skill, dice pool system, uh, rolled against target numbers. If you're familiar with Legend of the Five Rings or World of Darkness style, that's that's the root of the mechanics. There's some very mm-hmm. refreshing uh, new mechanics in there that I've never seen anywhere else, and which have gotten some pretty interesting reviews, positive. Um, and it's a you know a, an alternate reality, not an alternate timeline. Uh, Pseudo Japan. It's got cyber th- mm-hmm. cyberpunk aesthetics, but it's not a cyberpunk. Thing. It's not dystopian. It is, it's not dystopian. Uh, there's no you know corporate state oppression stuff like that. Characters are you're intended to go into Noedo and have adventures, not to resist uh, or rebel or whatnot. And the reason I did that is one because that appeals to me personally as a writer. It makes it easier for me to create that content. And two, to differentiate it in a very busy space. There's a lot of neon junk out there. Some of it great, some of it incredible, some of it terrible. Uh, and But if you look are looking for modern gaming, a lot of it has dystopian themes. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that appeals for a reason, obviously, right? Cyberpunk is popular and the themes are important to that. It's not just the aesthetics. But if you love the aesthetic and love the vibe and want to tell a modern story, but you don't want it to be oppression or rebellion-based... There was nothing for that. So so that's what this is. And there's mechanics that reinforce why that's the case, uh, but I won't get too much into that. Um, and so to try to poach more customers from the other big neon urban games, uh, Shallow Run, Cyberpunk, you know, there's a dozen of them. Um, I've yeah, and even Thirsty Sword Lesbians has some. Of the aesthetic or the themes? Yeah, uh, some of the themes. Like I ran a Thirsty Sword Lesbian games that, game that was very cyberpunk. Because that of the theme in the book, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, the the Kickstarter I'm launching is called the 77 Stories in New Edo, um, and that's how you'd find it on Kickstarter. Or I'm sure there'll be links somewhere after this. But it is a series of plot hooks that are not dystopian. So there are stories for your modern neon urban adventures that revolve around things other than blowing up corpos for synth bucks. Uh, I think there's actually one story about blowing up corpos for synth box, but <laughs> <laughs> because how do you not? Um, but you know, it, adventures that don't all, you know, the resolution isn't all uh, combat. The way those good at social and you're investigative and all these things, there's a heavy mystical, spiritual element to it that that plays into this. Um, so it's a system agnostic uh, storyteller tool built yeah. for the way though, but which has. Uh, tools to translate any game specific stuff into other games there's a difficulty comparison table uh, there's a glossary that says if you've used a capitalized noun for a district or an npc describes who they are and what they are and stuff like that so it's the sort of thing that will be portable into any modern urban game and if your game doesn't have fox people and instead it has elves then just make the fox people into elves or whatever none of it's like the thema- or sorry the uh, the aesthetics of it are just a trap in right Mm-hmm. Um, but it's more that the plots are different things to do or different things for your characters to do in the city. And they're all a paragraph or a page long. They're not like a D100 list. They're uh, more fleshed out than that, but it's not an adventure for you yet. You, the storyteller will still have to make it into one, yeah. but it's got districts and enough of the um, the world building to make it seem full. So yeah. NPCs and regions and, and names of restaurants that the story takes place in and stuff like that, that you can just drop this into whatever your existing uh, game that you're running is and have it add a little bit of diversity to the adventures you're running while still being able to fit into a cyberpunk game or a shallow run game or a Thirsty Sword Lesbians game or whatever it may be. I have a feeling Thirsty Sword Lesbians is basically uh, this generation's... Um... Or is it uh, Renegade Nuns on Wheels or whatever the heck that old uh, series was called? Not familiar. I admit I don't know that one. Um, it's a Powered by the Apocalypse system game. so Which is always good. I've only played it a couple of times, but I really enjoy it. So I have... That, that sounds th- awesome. Yeah, Yes, it does. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, oh, I have just kind of... Weird fascination with Kickstarters, um, you know, partly because of the podcast. We have a show called Show and Tell where we bring on people who are doing Kickstarters and let them talk about their stuff. So I'm a little bit curious, Anya, if you don't mind, do you mind sharing yeah. a little bit about some of the nuts and bolts, like what your goal is, what, how you came up with that number? Because I I'm fascinated by that process. Yeah. So for me, uh, just keep in mind, while I am American, uh, I live in Germany, so my numbers are all in euros. Okay. Oh, gotcha. um, so. Uh, 
I have this whole complicated uh, spreadsheet that is calculating all of the numbers that I need uh, for this. And uh, my book is right now only about 50 pages long. Uh, it might be a little bit longer than that at the end uh, once I've gone through a couple of editing passes, uh, but it's 50 pages right now. Uh, and so my goal, uh, including uh, value added tax because Germany uh, is 1,700 euros. And then I have a whole bunch of different stretch goals beyond that, uh, all the way up to 5,000 euros. Because now, what, uh, uh, it's a little bit more small. Is PDF scale. only? Both. Okay. Yeah. So I have, um, so I have the PDF. I have the soft cover, uh, perfect bound book. I have uh, streaming overlays. I have premium potion bottle shaped dice that are being uh -huh. custom made oh. for the. I, I'm so excited. Uh, Rune Fable in the UK. Uh, his name's Miles. Uh, is an incredible dice maker, and he specifically made these designs, these shapes of dice for my Kickstarter. Cool. And they are just so cool. I'm so excited about them. He's still working on them. So uh, the artworks that I have, like the preview images that I have for them for the launch are not the completed dice. Uh, mm -hmm. But that was just a timing thing because he had to actually go through and like 3D print them and then do the silicon molds. And then like he's doing literally every step. And that takes a lot of time. Yep. Is yeah. he manufacturing them or are you just buying yes. the blanks uh, from him and having them? Oh, no, he's... He's making the blanks. So what he, if you get an order for like five Start to finish. But if uh, your Kickstarter sorry, blows it out of the water and you get to, uh, are you set up for <laughs> uh, like, set yourself up for success? What happens if you have a thousand orders for those dice? Is he gonna be able to fulfill that? He would be able to fulfill yeah, that, okay. yes. It's just that it would be uh, much longer. <laughs> like my timeline for uh, his stuff specifically, like this Kickstarter is for the month of November, but uh, his timeline is like fulfillment in March, uh, just to give like time because he's also working with Hashling Games and a few others uh, that he's still making uh, dice for those big bashes. And he does like UK uh, conventions, like he'll be at Dragon Meet and stuff like that. I think he's at, yeah, he's at Dra Dragon Meet in uh, December. So he still has his own stuff that he needs to do as well. Um, but uh, he did the dice for my last crowdfunding campaign uh, for Tea and Toadstools, which is another solo game. Um, and that one, um, it's a little bit smaller scale. I think that it's a little bit more niche of a uh, an interest. And so I think that I ended up with about 25 sales of those dice. Also, that game doesn't actually use dice. It's just that we're all dice gremlins and we love dice. <laughs> yeah. My you whole know. businesses revolve around dice. So. Yep. Uh, but this one specifically uses D4s and D8s. And so he's made D4 and D8 potion bottle dice. Mm -hmm. And they are so beautiful. I love them so much because they're inset to look like actual potion bottles. Amazing. Like with liquid inside them. They're, it's incredible. I love it. Very cool. So, and then I guess my other question would be, and this can go for you as well, Salty, what sort of things do you do for advertising? Like, are you buying ads on Reddit or Facebook or TikTok? Is it all just word of mouth, podcasts? Like, what? how are you getting the word out to people, if you don't mind sharing? <laughs> Besides, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, so I was I was at MCM London, like I've told you guys many times now, uh, um, over the past weekend, because it's a short flight for me uh, from Germany. And so I actually just, I printed off uh, uh, 250 of these postcards. They have whoop, QR code, description, uh, where to find it. And so that it is that's a pretty design that shows some of my artwork. Um, but uh, that was really big in uh, getting the word out about it. But then also I'm working with Tattered Bear. Uh, they are doing some of the promo uh, for the Kickstarter. And then I'm I'm posting about it on social media. Um, I have the, the play testers who will play test the game on Twitch and then post the VODs. So I'm able to link back to that. I also have uh, someone who reviews games uh, who's going to be posting an article about it on the first. Okay. So doing uh, some uh, some of those things. Okay. Is there anything salty you're doing or you have done that's kind of outside of what Anya has already covered? No, I don't think so. She seems to have uh, taken a very uh, uh, broad and, and holistic approach to this thing that makes me nervous about my campaign. <laughs> I honestly have no clue how my first campaign went as well as it did. And I raised 36,000 Maple Leaf dollars. 
Um, <laughs> and then a few of those dropped <laughs> off and, and I netted just over 30. Uh, and, and I can't remember what my goal, sorry, my goal was six grand. And, and to answer your earlier mm-hmm. question on that, I made that up. Mm-hmm. I'm a finance geek and I'm good with spreadsheets and I have a business degree or two. And I was like, eh, six grand. It's not going to hit it anyway, so who cares? Right. Uh, yeah. I, that, I think that was because I'd already spent 5000 bucks on art. And I was like, if I can get that back, I'll be happy. Yeah. Of course, I still would have mm-hmm. had a loss, right? Art is always the expensive bit. Yeah. Yep. So, but now I don't remember how many pre-signups I had before my campaign started, nor where I got them. I was posting mm-hmm. on Reddit and Reddit has since um, my discord calls it murfed, which is a term that I'm not familiar with. I posted too much about my own game and they said, screw off. Don't post here anymore. Uh, uh, so now I, now I solicit my discord to post for me, which is medium success. Uh, I use okay. Facebook ads, which have been generating some ticks. Uh, mm-hmm. But you know, I'm not sure if I'm really getting, if it will turn back into profit or, or sorry, or sales through Kickstarter. Um, and I'm lined up for one other podcast on scheduled for launch, which is a podcast specifically for this thing, uh, okay. that I, uh, about a, a, a run by a local guy here, but which has a decent little audience. Um, and other than that, the usual social medias, and there's a sign up, up a couple FLGS and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. this game, this release will be f- uh, maybe 60 pages. Uh, and the, the, it'll have a much more humble art goal. So again, I'm spitballing it all. And if it's 2000 bucks, it'll be 2000 bucks and, and whatever. Um, but I mean, at some point before the campaign starts, I'll, I'll, I'll nail those numbers down a little bit better, I hope. <laughs> so, I mean, interestingly, from the business perspective, uh, I remember making a, 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 as my first Kickstarter kind of started to not get away from me, but to do way better than I thought, I promised to reinvest every dollar. I said, I'm not going to take profit from this thing. This isn't my job. At the mm-hmm. time, I had a job in finance, and I was well paid to do boring things. And so I wanted to reinvest all the money that I got from that back into the game. Um, and I thought that that would be lots of money, and it wasn't. I've now sold $53,000 in revenue, and I have $53,000 in expenses for the game, which is interesting. Uh, you know, why would anyone ever do this? Now, obviously, for mm-hmm. the love of it. Right. Um, yeah. And those expenses are, you know, the sunk cost of, of producing all the books that are profit when they sell at the moment. So there's a couple of potential dollars to be made here. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. But I don't know how anyone does it. How many, like, how many gold tier sellers are there out there? I think it's only nine percent of 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 DTRPG is up that high, and I make no money. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. it's a couple hundred bucks a month, which is fantastic. Don't yeah. get me wrong, but but it's certainly not the sort of thing that anyone can quit a job to do. Right. <laughs> No. I, I read something from uh, Kevin Crawford where he says that he sells about a thousand units a month. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's digital or physical or both or whatever it may be. Um, and, 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 the, and, you know, you work backwards from a reasonable profit margin, assuming some are digital and thus pure profit, et cetera, et cetera. And the guy's doing okay, but not as good as he would be if he just had a full-time job, probably. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. probably, he's probably doing a little bit better because he's got fantastic Kickstarters, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm jealous of his Kickstarters. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and the books are good, too. It's not mm-hmm. just marketing, oh, yeah. right? It's not just yep, yep. Um But here's a guy that is one of the bigger names in the small business, and and you look at it, and fantastic, astronomical success from what we could c- compare. Then you're like, oh, well, it's about the same as being a pharmacist or something like that. It's probably yeah. taken them 10,000 times as many hours, though. <laughs> but I know I don't think anyone on the screen is doing it for uh, for money, right? Oh, no. 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 I genuinely, nice. I have not budgeted. <laughs> I have not budgeted paying myself into this Kickstarter because oh, I wanted God. to make sure that it's a success. Yeah, and can't. then if it goes over that amount, awesome. Then I will, then I'll be paying cocktail artists to make cocktails designed after my potions. And then eventually I will pay myself. Yeah. But um, that's one of the stretch goals uh, is cocktails awesome. and mocktails. I'm very excited. It was not my idea. It was my moderator's idea. And I was just like, oh, that is, that is genius. That's smart. Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, but yeah, my thought process is that I put these also on my Itch.io shop. And so I I make money off of them from the Itch shop. And so uh, all of this is getting it to people so that they can enjoy and play the game. Yeah. yeah. yeah that, that's I mean, the it- payment for me. If someone plays the game mm-hmm. I wrote and then like they tell cool. me about it, I'm like, that, awesome. I can't put a dollar amount on that. 
Uh, but mm -hmm. I love it. Like that's that's what I'm going to get back from it. And it's also yeah, I mean, been a dream of mine since I was a little kid to have a book on a shelf with my name on it. Like in my head, it was going to be fantasy, but uh, yeah. I guess technically a game counts as fantasy. I don't know. But yeah, yeah. it's going to be a big deal for me when I have that first copy of a book with my name on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. everything I get goes right back into the company. I don't actually get to see any money from it yet. <laughs> I'm in the same yeah. boat. This, the uh, hmm. Sorry, what did you say? I said I'm in the same boat with the with my game ship, uh, shop. You know, We're not making any money at, at the moment. Everything goes back into the company. So. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I was going to say, this is like the closest I've gotten to fantasy yet. I mean, it's very fantasy because it's potion making. But... Um, all of my other games are, well, I have a mermaid game, and that uses the major arcana of tarot. Uh, so that's fantasy. Uh, but yeah, this is very much, yeah, sorry, what? Do tell. Oh, um, it's essentially just a, um, a journey of self-discovery kind of idea for the game. Uh, so you're a, uh, a mermaid leaving your coral reef home for the first time, and uh going on adventures and so uh you have um just the uh the major arcana are the different oracle cards and so each of them uh has a different thing that happens to you along your journey and uh there's a turning point card uh that has you then add in the ending card to the deck uh mm -hmm. and when you hit that ending card that's when the actual the game actually ends oh yeah that's right this was uh, uh solar uh, solar play yep yeah. More solo games, yep. Yeah. I'm trying to work on an RPG jam. that uses uh, tarot cards, but I've always had trouble with card-based RPGs where the cards mm -hmm. almost pull you out of the game rather than allow you to, mm -hmm. to immerse yourself. So, What do you mean by that? Well, okay. So, for example, uh, what I did was that when you went to perform an action, you do a number of cards equal to your attribute. You can uh, dump some cards and draw based off the second attribute, and then you use that to perform your action. Um, but the, you know, sitting there, okay, I can draw this many and I can think which cards I want to keep and which cards I want to, do. um, that's time not spent gaming. That's time spent mm. doing math, basically. Um, yeah, that gets a little bit too mechanical, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then you had, uh, things like Castle Falkenstein, where you had a small hand of, uh, cards and, you know, if you played a card of the, prop, uh, the suit appropriate to your attribute, you use the full face value, otherwise it's worth one point. So people would start hoarding all the face cards and the aces, uh, and that's like, okay, I'm going to perform this action. Critical success, critical success. And it's mm. like, that doesn't work. And so I'm trying to find a balance between, yeah, you know, using... Uh, like for the game, uh, like my partner saying, yeah, we want to use the tarot cards because then we can make tarot cards to the Kickstarter and all this other stuff. And I'm like, that's great, but I want it to be immersive, not pulling you out, and that's the hard part. Well, the important thing, especially with tarot, is that you take into account uh, the meaning of the card itself, because that will determine what the what the prompt is or what the ability is, and if it's uh, reverse or upright, also will affect it as well. So, if you have min maxers, well, uh, they don't know, say, for example, if it's uh, upright or reverse, and maybe it's a, a good or a bad thing, and uh, uh, so you could maybe get away get get away from that min maxing that way. I was thinking about that too because I actually was going to put in the meanings, but then mm -hmm. the player and the game master are looking up the meanings every time a card is played, and again, that's pulling mm -hmm. you out of the immersion. So it's it's a thing I've been struggling with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've played around a little bit with with cards. Like I'm I'm a tinkerer, you know. I just I'm always thinking about things. Most of it goes nowhere, uh, but I have thought a little bit about how I might do something with cards and kind of piggyback on what Anya was saying. Is I like the idea of maybe beginning of a game you draw a hand of cards and those are the ones you have the whole game. So you maybe you draw maybe not, but for the most part, let's say I got five cards, and I can go oh, okay. This is a really good card. And this is a bad card. So I get to choose. I, this is something I'm going to choose to fail because yeah. it's not super important. It'll be fun. It'll be interesting. So I'm going to choose to use my fail card here because it might be fun, but it's not like life or death. And then I'll keep my good card for that life or death moment. But you could add in a, a random element where I play my really good card, but randomly it becomes really bad. So it's not mm. success. It's like a degree. This is going to be either really good or really bad, but it would, some other, you know, interaction will determine the positive or negative i'm just determined it's going to be big one way or the other so that might be mm -hmm. something you could do that's not not too complicated it's good bad 
severe, not severe type of a thing. So. Yeah. Uh, five words in, you got me thinking of a new way to do it. And the more you were explaining, <laughs> the more it, it started gelling. It's like, yeah, yeah. I was just thinking like, you know, the player plays down so many cards and that's what they play through the entire game. It's already there. It's face out, you know, mm -hmm. it's available. And then it's like, Okay, I'm doing the same. I'll use one of these cards. If it's uh, upside down, it's uh, it subtracts from my attribute. And if it's right side up, it adds. But once I've played it, I can draw a new one. And that way, they're not having to do all this complex stuff. It's already mm -hmm. right there. They're thinking mm -hmm. ahead and away they go. So I might go with that. Thank you. I love, I love the idea thing. of failing on purpose when it's like yeah. appropriate. So that was I was going to say, uh, failing up. So powered by the apocalypse systems, I, I adore them for this. Um, forward, when yeah. you fail your roll, then you get experience points. So you, mm -hmm. you're failing up because that's what allows you to level up. Mm -hmm. and to get more abilities. So uh, giving a mechanical advantage for failures can also uh, kind of negate that as well. And, and the card drawing... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Play, I'm sure, right? Hmm? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Oh, and, and make for some fun gameplay at the mm -hmm. table. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Rather than just, oh, I missed my roll. Okay, next turn. It's like, right, right. oh, okay, well, it's, we're, we were looking forward to this because we wanted the XP. Uh, mm -hmm. And then how do we make this fun? Because, or sorry, how do we make this a narrative or more, more exciting or what have you? Yeah, my favorite question. So for context, I'm a professional game master. Um, so my favorite question to ask my players when they're, when they fail is, okay, what were you trying to do? And how does that get screwed up now with what you've done uh, with this failure? And they've come up with some fascinating things. I, I love that concept. I, I do occasionally some like panels on how to GM and how to get started. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of GMs will do the thing like, what does it look like when you kill the ogre? Like describe your final kill. Mm -hmm. And I encourage people to do that with skill checks. Like if you do a really mm -hmm. good skill check, well, what does it look like in your head when you do this? But my favorite thing is to tell me what it looks like when you fail a skill check. Yeah. Um, and I use the example of like a barbarian climbing a cliff just because it's simple. So you're a barbarian trying to climb mm -hmm. a cliff, you fail. Why did you fail? Because if I decide for you, I'll probably say you slipped and fell and fell on your butt and it's ha-ha. <laughs> but, but the player might go, well, I just didn't pick a good route. Like I was too impulsive. Yeah. I just started climbing and I got to a point where there's no one could have climbed. Yeah. So I climbed back down. Yeah. That I is a very a different. Grip, but it was a hornet's nest. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's a yes. very different uh, concept to that player on what failure mm -hmm. looks like. And it can be additive and story rather than just, oh, you fell on your butt, you know. Um, yeah. Can't do it every time, but I love asking people, why did you fail that? I have a story for mm -hmm. that. Uh, sure. My wife was playing a ranger in one of my D&D campaigns. Uh, completely botched her perception check while she was on uh, in camp as being the night watch. So uh, I said, okay, you know, some time passes, and then you hear this strange crunching noise. So, you know, it's like, so the group is trying to wake up, they look over, and there's this ogre eating the horses <laughs> off to one side. <laughs> that okay. Was similar to that. Um, my party was, uh, um, you know, they had just gotten together and they just started to mesh well with each other. And, uh, they put the elf on, uh, on, you know, watch duty cause you know, elves only need four hours of meditation. And, uh, yep. you know, I pulled out my nighttime encounter table. It had a hundred things on it. I was like, cool. I rolled and I'm like, wow, this is, this is, this is a party wipe. And, uh, so I'm like, okay, so, uh, you're, you're on watch, uh, roll. Your role at that time it was your your search spot and listen check, mm -hmm. and then now it's just perception. So he he rolled that one. I'm like, okay, crap. I'm like, okay, we'll roll this one. And he rolls again. It's like a two or a three, and I'm like, man, your dice really don't like you. I'm like, okay, so uh, the night passes. The elf doesn't wake anybody else up for the uh, for the morning, and uh, you all wake up and you just find the elf gone. And he's like, well, what happened to me? And I'm like, well, you don't know. You're dead. <laughs> and so later on like that day which was just you know a few more minutes of gameplay they're walking along and they find this corpse of a dr green dragon dead and it has choked on the elf <laughs> it had come up and used its ability snatch and swallow on the elf and then okay. start choking on it so it got out of there to get away from the other party member so it didn't wake it up and then ended up dying and so they had the elf's body, and I was like, you know, just take it to the next town and get them resurrected. I did something somewhat similar, but as a as sort of a misdirect. I had a, a dwarven player 
characters who failed a spot check on the overnight. And I made an encounter where the, the everyone else woke up and saw this giant, like, super-sized snake with the big, you know, dwarf-sized lump inside its belly slithering away. And it turned into a big chase, and it turned out the dwarf was just somewhere else doing something else. When they, they killed the snake, it wasn't the dwarf. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like it. Milk. It's like, yeah. <sighs> Who knew so, the, uh, the dwarf was a druid all along. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, back, back to the, the card mechanics. I've only ever played one card-based game, and it's wands and laser guns, and I picked it up at a con. Yeah. And it's a solo, you know, card-based game. Fun. I played through it at the con, had a good time. Great writing. Um, and, and But recently, like, the way there's a crunchy game there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of rules in it and it, mm -hmm. it, it satisfies the dice goblin and everybody by rolling these big handfuls of dice but a contact of mine uh was talking up noedo for some reason he's he's not a gamer but he he loves the concept of this thing he's like oh my buddy wrote this book it's always oh he's got his name on a book is a novelty for everybody still oh, yeah. i don't know if it's mm. ever not a novelty right and so he was talking it up somewhere and he met a gent that develops phone games uh hmm. and, and the guy's like oh i love the aesthetic of this let's let's try to convert it um and it was because he was developing an engine for the games that he just needed some ip to create a game in and the aesthetics work he's like oh these aesthetics are fantastic can you just write out some rules for me to make this into a, a card game it's like, and then he thought it was easy because he's not rpg or as well he's like well just you know convert it just use whatever that kind of thing hmm. and so i spent a couple of weeks with this guy going back and forth on how to convert my 300 page crunchy ass old school uh rpg into a Ooh. quick and easy phone game based on card flips and it never worked hmm. but it was a really interesting exercise for me hmm. as a developer like uh, i developed this thing in isolation and i mean the bad isolation like i, mm -hmm. I don't think i played a new game after 2003 uh while i was okay. writing this thing i kind of fell out of the hobby wrote it narrative before i started to skin the the systems into it that wrote the systems based on my 1990s and early 2000s gameplay, um, influenced heavily by all five armor world of darkness. Mm. And, and then when I finished the thing, I was on a damn boat in the middle of nowhere. I didn't even have the internet for oh, wow. years, not consecutively, but that was where the, the finishing touches got put on the game. Um, and, and then I come, you know, I go on the Kickstarter and, and everyone's like, Oh, it's this, it's that compared to something. And, and I hadn't been in the world for 10 years of games and so to discover all these new mechanics was like oh my game is written and it's outdated already mm -hmm. um and and i see all these fantastic new systems and i'm like oh i want to write a second edition of my game but i mean it's popular and it's niche i guess that people still like some of these these old school style games but hearing all these new mechanics and, and implementing dice and different resolutions and, and mm -hmm. more narrative ways of 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 describing failures and stuff like that, but making it part of the game, not just a, a DM skill. Um, mm -hmm. It's such a tease to say like, okay, I, I, got, I got to invest in this thing and continue working on the one I've got out there because people seem to like it and it would be doing them a disservice mm -hmm. to throw it out and rewrite it as, in second edition, right? Um, but man is attempting. <laughs> <laughs> I want to touch on, you, you talked about, again, like trying to design something and failing. I, I feel like failing is a bad word in like the TTR TV, because everyone takes everything, like I, I've come up with an idea, I'm gonna take it to Kickstarter, it has to be successful, because there's there's that grind and hustle that everything you create mm -hmm. has to become a thing. There's value in failing, <laughs> you know, trying yeah, to do Yeah, it's something. a learning process. Yeah, and you know, so I just, I want people to not be afraid to be like, I tried this for, you know, six months, didn't work, now mm -hmm. I moved on. But you learn mm -hmm. something through that process that will make the next thing better. And maybe yeah. it's three down the line that you get the thing that's really, really good and goes to Kickstarter. I just, I don't know. I, and it could be I'm in a bubble, but I just feel like failure is mm -hmm. kind of become a bad word in oh, the yeah. world of the, crowdfunding. Um, our second Kickstarter didn't make it, for for example, mm -hmm. and that was a learning experience. Yeah, and I think that a lot of people, uh, they don't do the research. They don't take the time to think about, oh, this is the scope of what I should try to do. Like with uh, Tea and Toadstools, the other crowdfunder game that I did this year, that one, uh, I did it uh, very, very small scale, just like testing the waters to see because uh, the last uh, crowdfunding thing that I had done was for art school. <laughs> Like that was way, way back when. And so I uh, needed to see what it was like 
in the TTRBG scene uh, to do a crowdfunding campaign. And so uh, that's now that I have that and I have kind of an idea of it, now I'm more comfortable to do a much bigger project. And this is even uh, yet another stepping stone. Like I'm a, I absolutely adore my game uh, and I'm really, really excited for people to back it. Uh, but I am also working on a Powered by the Apocalypse game. So that's going to be like 200 some odd pages mm -hmm. when it's done, <laughs> maybe more. So uh, just continuing to build on my knowledge base uh, to continue to garner that that knowledge and hopefully success. Right. Yeah. I mean, to Kit, one of Kit's first points, but he, I'm not sure if it was on camera or not. But when he said they prefer to write mechanics than than fluff, than the mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Um, and I'm probably on the other end of it. Like I love the mechanics, and it's so gratifying to get them to work after all the mm -hmm. testing and all of that. Uh, but you know, I, I, I like writing the fluff sections, the adventures and the NPCs and, and the backstory yeah. and the setting guides and the history and all that. Yeah. Uh, that's just fun. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I, I'm always, I'm always like, okay, what other kind of game can you make? Like in my, I made this, this mini skirmish game, which has nothing to do with the game system for Nuevo. Yeah. I, it uses some dice and I, I don't even play skirmish games. I just, I made one up from scratch, even though mm -hmm. there's probably mm -hmm. a good solution for what I wanted to do, but it was just something to, to do. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the, like this, this wanting to turn these things that we love RPGs and playing these games and whatnot and take them apart down to their engine and see what makes that work. And then reskin that somewhere else or build a different car out of it or something uh, mm -hmm. is, is a, something that I didn't expect to get out of this industry. Like, I, I don't know if anyone plans to come into this or if they just write something and it happens to them, right? Like, yeah. how do you Yeah, that's up? what happened to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, ah, this would be fun to do on the, my weekends or in the evenings or with my friends or whatever it may be. And then it turns mm -hmm. out two years later, you've got a book in the game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but now that I'm in it, now you think about it from the business perspective of what else can I offer, right? Mm -hmm. And I really want to make an exploration tile-based game. Uh, but I don't play any of those games or I don't know anything about them. So it's a, you know, do I spend a year now doing some research or just start mm -hmm. from scratch and, and, and make it up from first principles, uh, which has its pros and cons, right? Um, but but something entirely different outside of Nuevo. So then, so then I'm doing a disservice to the community that wants something that I already have obvious <laughs> demand for. There's only one mm -hmm. of me. Uh, yeah. You know, the shop is one yeah. person. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a good problem to have because of the enthusiasm for it. Like, I don't watch TV. Uh, I, I'm not sure what happened with you guys, but I stopped reading during COVID and I don't get it. My, yeah. my, my, my dad were recently talking about this. He used to read about 100, pages, or 100 books a year and I do a third of that. Uh, but now it's been almost none. Anyways, yeah. part of the reason is because I sit in front of a computer and I just enjoy making this crap up all the time. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's, and you know, my wife gives me a bit of a hard time. We bought a PS5 and I never use it. <laughs> uh, and she, don't you don't want to play the games like ah oh, once in a while but i just love generating this both from the, yeah. the fluff content and, and and playing with the mechanics i guess and yeah it's so it's so gratifying to make a couple of bucks to make beer money from it yeah. so there was a game that uh, somebody had uh back in the 80s that i enjoyed called shadow lord uh i found it on ebay wound up uh, buying a copy introduced my friends to it uh, but it's a competitive game, and my wife likes cooperative games. So after we played mm -hmm. it, she's like, could you make this cooperative? Because, you know, I do game design. So I was like, sure. So I picked a setting that I wanted to do an RPG for, converted it to a board game, made it cooperative, then just kept on going. And eventually I made mechanics so that the enemy actually operates itself. So at the end of your turn, the bad guy does stuff, and it has the rules for this is how the bad guy moves, this is where they attack, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay, so I'm sitting on a finished board game. I just don't know how to get it past the, well, I've written it. Now what? Yeah. yeah. Well, there are some conventions, bring back a uh -huh. uh, where they have that, where you have almost like a shark tank sort of situation where you can, mm -hmm. you know, get selected to get in front of people who know what they're doing. You can pitch it. You can work through your mechanics. And, you know, sometimes you walk away with a publishing deal. If else, yeah, I know feedback. that uh, uh, Spielmesse in Essen, like it's one of the biggest board game conventions in the world, as far as I'm aware. And there's an entire section that's all about play testing. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are also uh, board game manufacturers who go there. 
Um, like there's this one, I forget the name of it, Panda something. Uh, they have like whole uh, box sets of samples of uh, different materials and things that they can uh, produce for your games. My only yeah. slowdown is that once I want to have it written, it's like I have to write 50 cards of this type and make each one individual. And that gets <laughs> tedious. That's the fun part. As... <laughs> oh, no, I have... Uh, uh, no, I, I don't have the focus for that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I have DID, and uh, some of my alters will just kind of completely flip out of boredom. I yeah. can't do mm. it. It's like, I got to make, you know, 30 character cards and give each one mm -hmm. a special ability unique to it, and my brain just melts. Uh, and that's why most successful game companies are companies with, like, yes. people. Like, Multiple hey, you're the mechanics people. person. You're the art person. You're this person. And yeah. when you're just doing it by yourself, or maybe, like, one or two people, the yeah. cognitive load is not, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's unwieldy at times, so. Yeah, I had to do Fox Magic by something. myself, and, like, I got it written in, you know, I had it written in two days, and then I did my second draft. But when it started getting to the, okay, so what are their abilities? Okay, what's the mechanics for their abilities? Okay, that's easy. Now I have to describe them. Oh, God, no. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear what you said again, Salty. Oh, I was saying that we're all good at something, but we're not good at everything, right? Right. So, yeah. yeah. You know, like to have that team would be incredible, but then there's already no money. So you have to find someone that's exactly. willing to do it yes. for, just for the love of it. The same oh, as God, you, yes. which is tough because if they love it that much, they probably love something a little bit different. They don't, you know, mm -hmm. they don't want to work on my stuff. They want to work on their stuff. So their stuff. Yeah. You really, yeah. I mean, I don't know most of my team is freelance. Teams. Sorry? Most of my team is freelance. And the trick is, yeah, okay, you're good at this and, uh, and you know, you're going to do this for me. And now I have to pay you, and that means I have to get yes. money in, and then I have to do, and mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's that's a juggling act I don't enjoy. Yeah. For me, there's I I really enjoy that initial burst of like creativity, like that manic mm -hmm. sort of like oh I'm just mm -hmm. everything's going into the every like the stew pot, and then once yep. I have the basics, I don't enjoy the refinement, which is mm -hmm. one reason why the the one game I've taken to Kickstarter was like a five year long process. Though mm -hmm. to be fair, it started as a joke. Like it literally was a joke uh, because I love the D12. I think the D12 is the best poly. Game. Yes, it's the best. Wow. I, not enough games use it. So I made a game just to get people to, to use D12s. Like that's the whole point. Yeah. Um, and so mm -hmm. the, the first name of my game was Michael's Needlessly and Ridiculously Overcomplicated Rules Light RPG. <laughs> um, and it. it was just like how many d12s Amazing. can i get people to roll before they realize that i'm just not kind of making Trolling fun of what's them. going on yeah. uh, yeah. uh, and after i did that like, like 10 10 or 11 play tests like i'm just secretly like teehee and behind the screen people kept going this is actually fun this is a, and I'm, mm -hmm. there's something you know and then i took away all the stupid stuff that i just threw in there to be silly and i actually had a kind of a fun game but it's a d12 dice pool like the mechanics are the yep. most basic in the world i love uh, that though it is yep. so much fun in the, in the, yeah. all the charts in the book are d12 base so every like because mm. it's a gmless game at zero prep so you just roll d12 you're playing a sci-fi action movie oh it, this is the thing oh, that cool. you're fighting this is the plot of what you're fighting you know um so if there's no cognitive load on anybody the d the dice mm -hmm. do all the work and then we just play pretend but d12s every game i make will have yeah. a d12 prominent yep my um so i've written two modules for dnd 5e and my first one is a silver bestseller now Yay. Congratulations. Uh, thank you uh but that What's one i have a um it's the curse of fate and i actually do have one of my um uh uh backing things is that i uh for the kickstarter is i have a a table of me playing me running the curse of fate mm. uh as because oh, wow. i am a pro gm so i can do that and i figured why not put that as an option on the kickstarter uh but yeah so uh there is a d12 table in the curse of fate simply because i i love d12s they're, they're pretty the and i never use them yep they're, they're <laughs> so. the best polyhedral <laughs> yep and, and what is that quantifiable or only qualifiable like what what's the metric oh. for the best there well, um, the thing is, they're very satisfying to roll. To roll. Yeah. Yeah. I love the response uh, I just got from three screens and everyone the enthusiastic. Yeah, so, telling yeah, me why with uh, the, the advanced story point system, I wanted to use a D12 because it's under use and I enjoy that die. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, you can use it for a table of one to four, one to six. Um, then you got, you know, everything in between that you can play with and how you uh, can use the dice for success based systems and everything. Um, so I made it basically a scale success system for the story points uh, using uh, the D12. 
and it yeah. works out very well. A lot of people like uh, having like you know six, eight, ten, d twelve, and suddenly throwing them around. It's a lot of so fun. mostly a tactile answer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's very much so. Yeah, I would agree. There's like a good heft to it. Yeah, um, yeah. but again, it's less pointy than a d twelve and more roundy than a d six. So mm-hmm. science. Yeah. Science. Um, <laughs> I was going to bring this up a, a while back when I was uh, I was enjoying the conversations. What about using uh, like some places sell things like D three, D five, D seven, D you know really weird yeah. numbers. Yeah. And I, I have a whole bunch of those. Like, what if I made an RPG that used those instead? How would that run? Apparently, there is. I one. think that would be fascinating. Dungeon Crawl Classics, basically that that is the game you're looking for. I do oh. really like playing Dungeon Crawl Classics, but I find those dice it's just a gimmick. I don't think they actually add anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you either have to have them, or you have to find a way to mock them at the table. You know, a D six and half is a D three. Yeah. Right? Or use a virtual dice roller. So I mean, I'm saying maybe you you create one that takes over the world. But generally speaking, I don't I don't find a lot of that. Oh, yeah. For uh, me, it's an accessibility thing uh, because a lot of people, especially um, I use a lot of D6s in my games simply Mm -hmm. because those are ones that most people will have. They're in Yahtzee. They're in most games. And so um, it's a lot easier to be like, hey, grab those D6s from your Monopoly game and then Mm -hmm. you can do the thing. So uh, somebody just bought Curse of Fate from our chat. Yeah. Hey, awesome. Thank you. So thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. (laughs) The um, the the skirmish game I made up uses just D6s for that reason. It's called Kitchen Table Robot Games, um, in that you're supposed to be able to play with whatever garbage you've got laying around the house, your kids' mm-hmm. toys, some Lego. I do kit bashing, uh, but if you got your old Warhammer or whatever, throw them all on the table, and it's simple enough rules that we play with like my six, six-year-old nephew, and he has fun. Um, but it's still a challenge. I played it at a con, and I had a full table of real adults with facial hair playing it for hours, mm-hmm. and it was tons of fun uh some dwarves and um uh but f- because of its it's it's supposed to be a free skirmish game if skirmish games are notoriously expensive uh, war, war, tabletop war gaming right like the models right. are a billion goddamn dollars yeah and so this thing was kit bash it use toys use whatever it is it's supposed to be a introduction to the world of skirmish and tabletop gaming uh to get your kids interested in it uh, but I use the D6 is because, like you say, everyone's got one. I don't want someone to have to go out and get a, get a free PDF from me and then have to go out and buy dice or buy anything, right? Um, you, I, I, to the point of t- uh, limiting your audience or whatever, like if you put this gimmicky dice in there, people may just mm-hmm. drop your game because of that. I won't pay a fantasy yeah. flight game. Like, no, I don't want to buy your special dice. Screw you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, not to say that they don't add mechanical value. Like it might be an interesting game mechanic that they've introduced with that. But mm-hmm. I'm not, I'll, I'll lose those dice. So then, can I play yeah. the game anymore? Do I do I have to? You know, so it's like I, I'm never going to do that. I will say though. Yeah. I, well, go ahead. I say I uh, I play. I don't play a lot of Power by the Apocalypse. I to be honest, I, I have this weird relationship. I really like Monster of the Week. And I had an amazing time playing masks. But whenever I run those games, I use D12s instead. <laughs> um, so I have my own chart of D12 based power by the apocalypse rather than D6s because I just think D6s are boring. They're the they're literally the dumbest die. But you're right; they're available everywhere, and you can't can't get away from that. So I'm sorry, Anya. What were you going to say? Yeah, no, I was just really going to say that. Huh? <laughs> I was going to say, tell us how you really feel. No, I literally, Monster Monster of the Week is my favorite system to run of all time. I'm actually going to be running a game tomorrow, which I'm very excited about. Uh, but And I, I just published another module for Monster of the Week right before this. <laughs> it's on my itch. But uh, no, um, what I was going to say is that uh, in terms of accessibility, uh, one of the things that I always try to do if I'm using something fun that maybe someone doesn't have access to, I try to give an alternative option. So uh, the example uh, that I have is with um, Mountaintop Isolation. Uh, Because it's a rational loan system, it uses a Jenga tower, a tumbling block tower, Uh, because you can't use brand names. Um, But not everyone can use 
the towers. Uh, not everyone has access to them. And maybe they're just not able to because of sounds like whatever. Um, like it is supposed to be uh, uh, the idea of like causing tension because if you knock over the tower, that's the end of the game. Uh, you're, uh, the example they give is that your sanity has crumbled basically. Uh, but uh, I created, I need to remember what it is right now, but I created an alternative system for if you just can't use or don't want to use the tumbling block tower here's this other way that you can still have this mechanic that is still accessible uh and it's just different yeah so just a quick jump in there if you like tumbling tower games and monster of the week i have a scooby-doo dread game that i i wrote oh, God, dread, it, yes. it is um 20 years after scooby died and it's basically Clue oh, the movie meets Scooby-Doo where uh -huh. the, the gang are brought back together. They get a mysterious note that says, I know who killed Scooby-Doo. So they all meet back in this like creepy haunted house and they're trying to solve that final mystery of who killed Scooby-Doo. But it's also very adult. There's like actual like Saw movie style traps and people are getting oh, okay. dismembered. It's oh, okay, so much that fun. part I can't do. I mean, you, uh, could, you could lessen that, but it's basically uh, a LARP. Like, I mean, this is like mm. the most heavy role play in the world, but it, we use the, the Jenga tower. It's so much fun. Nice. Uh, I've got to hop off in five minutes, just as a heads up. All right. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, then the floor is yours. What do you want to say before you go? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, was it? What? I, you know, you put me on the spot here. Got to ask me a question. <laughs> Sorry. You put yourself well, on the so, spot. Uh, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I asked for that, I guess. <laughs> you said that you, uh, you were interested in making a tile game? Uh, a tile yeah. version game? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, without scaring the shit out of my Nuido audience who wants more Nuido content. Sorry about the swear. Um, uh, so I, I, I bought a, a sailboat in the spring and not with Kickstarter money. I quit a full-time job and me and my wife are starting a, uh, a weddings on a sailboat business. So I've become a commercially licensed captain and I'm becoming um, provincially, whatever you call it, uh, credited to be an officiant here in Ontario mm -hmm. so I can marry people on the bow of my sailboat. But I brought it up from Florida and I had a month on that boat with one other guy. And, and it made me think of all the pastimes I spent going long distances very slowly with nothing to do. And the journey is of course the, the fun there, right? You know, even if we're in a canal system in upstate New York, blah, 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 who cares? It's like this, it, it was exploring even then the mast was down and I wanted to find a way to convey that excitement somehow that I find in sailing long distances to folks on tabletop that don't have access to that for whatever reason. Um, this all makes me sound rich. I'm not rich. Sailing is not, <laughs> not for rich people. There is rich people sailing, but most people have very cheap boats, cheaper than your car. Um, yeah. And this is my full-time job now. So so just as a, a quick explanation. And their money this, sink as well. Yeah. Oh God, BOAT stands for break out another thousand. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so the tile game, I would like, because I haven't played any, I'm just imagining, and I love the aesthetic and the tactile look of these of these exploration games, but something where it's basically a platformer where you're moving forward through through the tiles of some sea exploration. And of course, it'd have to be a fantasy world mm -hmm. uh, or an imaginative world to make it more exciting than just going 2,000 nautical miles over flat blue ocean with nothing bad happening. Um, and I wouldn't want it to be too realistic because it would probably trigger me. Uh, but, you know, it, it would. I want it to be magical and fantastic right sure. um but that's as far as i've got if you guys have recommendations for great fun exploration tile-based games please drop them somewhere so i can find them because that's research for me mm -hmm. um but but yeah the idea will be to somehow convey my love of of sailing and going long distances very slowly uh, but in tabletop format that doesn't take as much preparation and crunch necessarily as, as nuita does uh, to 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 share another one of my passions. Now, some people love the crunch and the setting and all that of a very deep TTRPG. But if you just want to sit down for forty five minutes and do something, then I could probably have a solution for that too. I just have to get it out of my brain. Right. <laughs> Look up Forbidden ever... Island. Forbidden Island. All right, here we go. Here we go. It's a tile based game. Uh, basically, you're trying to get treasures on an island while the island is sinking, and each tile basically starts to flood, then sink, and goes away. Yep. Yeah, okay. so Forbidden Island, Forbidden Desert. Those are the uh, two games that do that that I can think of. Have you ever played Takedo? I love Takedo. Oh, no, I haven't. Oh, what a beautiful box, though. <laughs> yeah, it is beautiful. But oh, it's yeah, basically, I know the box. It's a game where it's, like, so chill and relaxed, and you mm -hmm. win by having the best vacation. 
Yes. And, right. and if you're wanting to like highlight game. the you know the beauty of the ocean sailing, then that might be a touch point just for the the way the scoring works is where if you have the best time, you win versus like um, fighting the monsters. You can download it on your cell phone uh, and uh, ba basically play it on your cell phone with uh, 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 computer uh, opponents. So mm -hmm. you can get a feel of the game without having to, you know, break out the right. box and get like four. It's also expensive. It's a pretty expensive because it's a very yeah. beautiful game. So it's oh, yes, it is. We got yeah. the deluxe version uh, recently. Mm -hmm. oh. um, all I was going to mention before you go was that uh, my distributor uh, makes blank dungeon tiles. Um, they're like, you know, about that big. And then they yep. have big, the the bigger ones that are like four of those put together, um, where you can literally just draw whatever you want on there and make up your own rules if you really cool. wanted to. So okay, yeah. Uh, um, I think I, you've put me in touch with them already, so I'll I'll have to dig through my emails and find that because that would that would, that would just be something fun for me to sit around and do. Yep. While the boat's on the the yard out, out of the water over the winter. Perfect. <laughs> Um, I do have to run, so I apologize about dropping off early. It was fantastic to meet everybody. Yeah, it's nice I to hope meet you, your, sir. your yeah. Kickstarter yeah. goes fantastically. Good luck with that, Mike. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, nice to have the you next back. Con, I hope uh, your hope your weekend goes really well. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, just kind of being tangent tangential to Ragnarok out here, talking with the, the the organizer. He and his wife seem like they're pulling their hair out, having a great time. But I don't know how they did it. So mm -hmm. with your, what do you say, 30 vendors, it seems like yeah. probably about the same size. Man, that's going to be a big undertaking. So good luck to you both in the coming days. Uh, yeah. Gents, it's, it's a, been a pleasure as always. I appreciate you having me on. And, yeah. and look for the 77 stories in New Edo. Awesome. All right, Captain. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thanks, guys. Bye. 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 And then, and then, then there was four. And then <laughs> <one time. Ow. laughs> Great minds. Yeah. Okay. Mine so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, let's go to talk about the conventions a bit. So how did you grow your convention and how were you able to manage it? So again, it, obviously it started super small. It was in my house. So mm -hmm. it was like the, you know, the first one was like 12 people. The second was around 20. Uh, but, but we were pretty fortunate when we did decide to go and make it a public event. Like I had the podcast and like, we've never been like critical role, but there was a period of time where mm -hmm. we were one of the more popular RPG podcasts that did what we did. Mm -hmm. So we had built relationships and we were able to get Rich Baker, Rob Schwab, um, John Wick, not the guy who kills people, but the guy who makes games. <laughs> I know um, uh, and then some other podcasting people who came out. So even though we had this really super tiny convention with like 127 people, we had some mm -hmm. A-list celebrities that were able to come out and that helped us get a draw and then we still have the podcast uh so we we've kind of got a built-in audience from that as well but the biggest thing is just the continuation growth like we're, we've been in the same place pretty much since since year four we go back every year it's always right around the same weekends either the first or second weekend in november and then we're just trying to get the word out because it happens literally every year last year was our 10th mm -hmm. year and i had someone come up and say i lived in dayton my entire life i had no idea we had our own convention i'm like i know i would i don't know how to fix that uh you know we do facebook ads we were on the news we've been in the newspaper we put flyers up in the game stores in the library and everywhere we can think of but we're still missing people so that mm -hmm. that is really my biggest opportunity is how do i get the people who not have to fly across the country or fly in from germany but the people who live 20 minutes away Hire a press scan to go house to house and uh, drag them out. Yeah, I need something. Uh, we've talked about maybe doing a billboard ad, but those can be really expensive. Uh, we talked mm. about maybe putting an ad on the in the like the theater because I, I live in a really small town in Kentucky now. And like our little rinky dink theater, when we go to watch a movie, it's all like local chiropractic, chiropractic, local car dealer. Like those are the ads mm -hmm. we're seeing, yeah. but it's like 1500 bucks. And that's like 10% of my total budget, you know, like mm -hmm. our whole cons 20 K roughly. So that's Every a huge investment, never... which if it doesn't pay off at all, you know, yeah. Yeah. And again, um, I'm barely breaking even as it is. Radio ads. Um, there's not a big radio culture in the area. I did that a couple oh, okay. of years. Uh, radio, I'm gonna again, it's weird. One of my jobs is I'm a program director for a school based radio. Radio's mm -hmm. dead, no one listens to radio, everyone listens to Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Like, no one's going to the radio unless yeah. they're like 90 years old. No, yeah, uh, our local that, college radio. But when I had a car, <laughs> sorry, 
Go ahead. When I had a car in the States, uh, we don't own a car here, but when I had a car in the States, I would listen to the radio when I was driving anywhere. So that well, was- again, I'm, not, I'm, I'm exaggerating for comedic effect, but probably when the ads came on, you switched stations. Like a lot of people have like the presets, maybe not everybody, but, but I think so many people have XM radio these days, they have satellite radio or they mm-hmm. have Spotify, you know, you put your phone and it hooks into your Bluetooth, whatever. So yeah. it's, it's really hard to, to gauge the value of radio ads, but maybe mm-hmm. I'm not saying no, we did do the one we did yeah. was a college based radio. Cause there is a college in mm-hmm. Dayton. So we did that. Um, we're trying to get like the local gaming clubs. I'm on a bunch of discords, uh, yeah. just to, you know, interact with people. So that kind of thing. Oh, there you go. You make ads for the different Discord groups, and every now and then it just pops up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, two things. Uh, you yes. mentioned you have a car, right? Me or Anya? Yeah, you. Yes, yes. I do have a car. Uh, get a uh, a car magnet. It's mm. 45 bucks for two uh, that have an advertisement on the side. And so you can just drive down the mm-hmm. road, and you'll be like, convention. You know, that's the <laughs> uh, second thing. Honestly, sure, yeah. I was going to say, second it's, thing, do it's not a bad idea. Community, Sorry, I can't. have a community page for their web for Facebook. So we do. We have a we have the Facebook page um, for a catacon. The, the 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 two big problems again. I'm not trying to like naysay. I, I love the ideas. Is when I created or when I first launched the the uh, the convention, I lived in northern Cincinnati, and we were based mm-hmm. in Dayton, like half an hour away. I have since moved. I am now three and a half hours away from Dayton, so the car decal is not going to help. Um, wow. Yeah. But also the name of the convention is a catacon because it's supposed to be the RPG Academy. That's our podcast convention. But if you right. just see the word, everyone thinks it's arcade con, like your brain puts an R in there. Uh, so if you just see the word, you assume it's a video game convention. So we are constantly have, I literally have people do walk-ins and go, what kind of games do you have? And I'm like, D and D and this and that and the other. They're like, do you have Pac-Man? I'm like, no, I do not have Pac-Man. <laughs> so, that is a, it's a terrible name, but I love it. So we're going to keep it. But I do get pushback every year that it's a terrible name. I'm like, I know, but it's, it's, you know, it's our 11 years. We're going to change it. We should have changed it nine years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a small, like, up, uh, getting off of the ground, uh, very, very small uh, TTRPG convention in the Netherlands that's near me. Their first, uh, <laughs> It sounds so weird, but it's only like two hours by train from me. Anyway, um, so it was their first year this year, uh, and they did. It was just one day convention, and then uh, next year it's going to be two days. And uh, they, um, I'm not sure how they're doing their advertising, to be honest. But their problem right now is the name as well, because they technically have two names. Mm. Uh, their logo says Rincon, and their name is Roll Initiative Con. Um, yeah. Dude, and so like Roll for Initiative. <laughs> it's just it's just one of those things where you like you really need to decide. Yeah, you gotta uh, pick but one. I'm. Yeah, I went to it this year because uh, I'm in the European actual play scene mm-hmm. and a whole bunch of people that I knew were going there and I got to meet them for the first time in person. Nice. Yeah, it was awesome. Uh, we played a lot of different games. I ran a uh, Kids on Brooms game mm-hmm. <laughs> immediately after buying the book, <laughs> which was a little bit stressful, Yeah, but well. it was fine. You know, uh, but it was really, really fun. Uh, but definitely you could tell that it was their first year. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of moving pieces and parts that you probably, mm-hmm. unless you think about it, you're just not going to, yeah. you're not going to think about like the organizing the events, scheduling the events, which table, mm-hmm. what time, you know, other events. And there's things like the convention center, the, the convention center I work with, I feel sometimes I've been told we're in an abusive relationship because it just like, I keep coming back and they keep making it clear that maybe I shouldn't, but uh, oh, no. we're kind of stuck there. And, you know, we have all these different things we have to do to make sure that we're following their rules and our guidelines, which are somewhere sometimes overly restrictive for what we, because they don't know what we do. Like they're used to hosting yeah. like a tool trade or like an RV thing. And I'm like, I just need tables where we can play games. Like that's all I need for yeah. you. And they're like, well, here's our $5,000, you know, electricity package, we will power all your vendors. Like, I don't need any of that. You know, it's it's just this weird thing. Uh, But one of the big things that I talk about our convention that I love is that it's, it's small, but we're very focused on role-playing games, which most, most conventions our size are, are not like they're, they're mostly Mm -hmm. board games and RPGs. We are mostly RPGs with board games, 
but the majority of our games are not D and D or Pathfinder. I love D and D. It's the first RPG I ever played. It's still the one I play more than anything. But probably about eighty percent of our games are something other than those two. So it's very indie focused. You're going to get to play games you may not get to play any other places, and that's like mm-hmm. one of my favorite things about the convention. You're going to find a new game that might become your favorite game with us. Yeah. Yeah. Funny enough, John Wick was the person who got me indirect, uh, indirectly got me into making uh, the story point system for my company. Mm. <laughs> Because uh, I have a game setting that I was working on, and it's like, uh, who do you think I should license, uh, you know, their game engine to use and stuff? And he's like, no, you don't do that. You make your own game engine, which is tailored specifically to the setting you want, and you go with that. And I was like, oh, okay. So I started yeah. making my own game engine and haven't looked back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> because your mechanics and your storytelling need to inform each other yeah. and mesh. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Ideally, you want someone else to go, how do I steal their engine? Or license it for my game rather than doing that for them like you create the game they come to you funny enough i made the game engine open license mm. oh cool <laughs> yeah I, I i tell people it's like uh the game is made so that the engine will flex to match whatever setting you want so mm-hmm. if you want to do a horror game you can the engine will go for horror if you want to do science fiction if you want to do fantasy if you want to do modern whatever you know the the engine's supposed to do that so i tell people it's like okay so what kind of game setting do you want yeah, okay, you can do that. Uh, do you want me to help you do it? You know, mm-hmm. and I uh, said, if uh, you know, if we like it, we'll publish it for you. If we don't like it, you can publish it yourself. We won't right. say boo. So, if you don't mind, give me the pitch on the on the how does the mechanics work? Okay, so um, the rule book is split into two parts. One is how the engine works, and one is the setup. The setup is how do you set up the character sheet and the specific mechanics you want for your setting. And the character sheet is split into background, attributes, and advantages, effectively. Okay. And then you decide how you want the mechanics to reflect on those, and then those will immediately plug into the engine. Um, which also sets it up so that regardless of which game you're running, if it uses that engine, the characters are cross-compatible without having to change anything. Okay. Yeah. But what, so, but what is the actual engine like? Am I rolling a D twenty looking for? Uh, it's a D twelve. It's a D twelve dice pool where you take yes. the highest. Hey. D twelve. <laughs> yeah, it's a D twelve dice pool where you take the highest number versus the difficulty and see how far you can surpass it. Okay. Um, if you just squeak past the difficulty, you succeed, but a complication comes up. If you just squeak into a failure, you get a benefit even if you failed, and then mm. it kind of goes on from there, and you, okay. you collect advantages and disadvantages, which you can then burn later on. Okay, so you're rolling like four or five D12s at a time, taking the best one? Uh, usually three or four. Uh, okay. You're allowed to burn attributes to uh, burn more. Oh, that's the other thing. Uh, attributes aren't how good you are at it. It's how important is that attribute to the character that you've built to tell okay. their story. Uh, uh-huh. Your background is what technically gives you your actual attributes. So you can make like, I'm a bodybuilder who can lift 500 pounds, but it's more about the, you know, uh, how my character puzzles things out that's important so my mental attributes are high my physical attributes are low because if your background says you're probably able to do this there's no role involved you just mm-hmm. do it right so it's like he has to do a feat of strength yeah okay there's no role you do a feat of strength that's fine mm-hmm. ah but the intellectual challenges okay then that's when the dice start coming out mm-hmm. okay and what's okay. like an average difficulty uh the average difficulty is seven okay so just solid about the path okay mm-hmm yeah, mm-hmm. but the thing is, if you want to get a good result, you want to get usually uh, about a nine or higher. Okay. And that that's if there's average difficulty. If it's something like really easy, uh, the example I use is uh, medicine. If you're doing first aid and you've just taken a first aid course, then you'll probably have a little bit of a higher difficulty than if you were a surgeon. That difficulty then drops if mm-hmm. you have to roll at all, and that's only if he's outside of his comfort zone. Gotcha. Okay. Mm. Okay. It's, it's fairly never to range up and put them back together. Give me a second. <laughs> oh, wait, no, no, I can't. Yeah, a friend of mine wanted to do a superhero car- uh, game. So I was like, great, so this is how you do superheroes. And then uh, somebody else was doing uh, some horror games. Like, great, this is how you do horror. Yeah. Uh, the back of the rule book has a bunch of sample characters from different genres. Mm-hmm. That's I'm currently tinkering mostly mental uh with the d12 supers game because uh, supers is like my second favorite rpg genre like fantasy. it is so hard to find a good one it is uh it and is i don't so know that mine will be but i'm i'm working on it um i, I well, recently played the new marvel one yeah. I, like the marvel face rip system was my second rpg i love that game mm-hmm. to death even though it's not a very good system i don't think but i still have a lot of fun playing it the and engine's I've, good 
I, I will say that the engine is good for what it wants to do. I mean, it's uh, basically, it, it does what it needs to do, but there's not, not, you have to add on other things, I think, to make it really sing. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But it, it still works. Like I can play it today and I have, I sometimes do play it at local conventions, uh, but I recently played the new, the new Marvel 616 engine, which is clunky, but fun. But I'm, I'm trying to come up with something that, because for me, it all comes down to a speedster. If you have a supers game, you have to be able to have a speedster that doesn't break the game, but it's still fun to play because in comics, speedsters would win every fight all the time if you wrote them correctly. Yeah. Um, so it's just kind of what we're doing. If you want to, uh, I mean, you and me can talk and we can uh, see if I can help you. Okay. Again, I'm very early in the process. Again, most of what I do is like mental and then I'll, like, I'll, I'll have like a weekend where that's all I do. Uh, but I'm thinking about doing is almost like a bidding sort of thing where if I'm like a tier one character, you know, it's like barely above like a street thug and you're tier four, you know, Thor, um, there's really no way I should be able to win that. So you just assume that Thor wins that fight every time. But I then might have you, a game engine for you. Then you have things where like, okay, but if there's five of us against Thor, then it's a little bit different. And if we all have laser pistols, then it goes up a tier. <laughs> so you have this like wagering system where, okay, well, I'm using my special hammer. So I get, I'm now tier five. So it's not like, how do you make that balance? But it'll only come down to one single role. So it cypher system kind of works the same way too. If you're familiar with that one is you do all your advantage edges and everything, but it comes down to a single role, but it'll use D12s because D12s are inherently better. So I have a diceless engine that works just like you were explaining okay. and I could easily convert it to a D12 system if you want to use it. I love D12s. So I'm, I'm open to, I'm open to looking at it. Can't guarantee okay. anything. And again, the game oh, probably will never go anywhere anyways. It took me five years to do my first one and I'm not a spring chicken anymore, but uh, maybe. <laughs> I know that feel. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you used uh, the ASP system, I could definitely help you with that and we can get it out the door for you. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to use the other system that I made, uh, it would require a bit of conversion, but I think it hits all the basics that you want. Okay. So Brian uh, is mentioned, he actually played in, I ran it on our stream, that Marvel game, he played Miss Marvel. So, Yeah. The first thing I do with the mm -hmm. superhero game is I have a, uh, a small stable of characters and I try to convert them over and see if it works. And if mm -hmm. it doesn't work, I'm not happy. Yeah. And mm -hmm. 616 could not handle pretty much any of the characters I made. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Mutants and Masterminds could, Silver Age Sentinels could, but I don't like that engine. And Facebook would have handled it easily. Mm. One of my favorites is Cold Steel Wardens. Uh, I know uh, I, I became friends with the designer through a convention where we played that game. Uh, it's a dice pool system. It's very, pretty simple, but I just, I like the lore and uh, the way the game works. It's pretty simple, but but fun. Mm. Uh, but yeah, to, to me, it all comes down to a speedster. If you can do a speedster, you can make a supers game. And if you can't, you can't. And it's just really hard to do well where it's fun to be a speedster, but you don't win every fight every time because you're faster than everybody else. So yeah. that's what I'm working on. So basically I'm trying to get away from it. It's like, it doesn't matter if you're a speedster or not the way the game engine works. It, it's all abstracted down to a single die roll and then we'll figure out, okay, well, why was I able to, to win this battle? Cause that's how it always works in, in the movies or the TV or the whatever. It's like, I should win this. So why didn't I type of a thing? You got to work backwards and add in the fluff to make it make sense. Or not. It's a comic movie. It doesn't have to make sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Phase of did terrible with that. They had um, they had a hyperspeed uh, skill where you got uh, multiple actions based on your power rank, and then you can make a fighting feat check to double or triple your actions. So as soon as you had like remarkable, and if you got the red feat, that's sixty actions in a turn. Mm. And then it's like, so what does that mean? <laughs> it means I win because you're a speedster. Yeah. That yeah, sounds exactly. broken. Yeah. 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 Uh, thinking about that, I was uh, before I actually mentioned it. I uh, think about it as like what you should probably do is you should have the attribute add to your fighting attribute to determine if you have one, two, or three actions, and that would work mm -hmm. a lot better. And then you can say, yeah, I get three attacks. It's technically a lot more, but it only counts for three because you know you want to keep mm -hmm. things fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, uh, with when it comes to superheroes. Almost everything is supposed to be broken. It should be more about the narrative than the dice rolls. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. My sister had made a necromancer superhero for mutants and masterminds. Uh, she would put hexes and curses on people. And then uh, if they performed specific actions, they would take damage based on the curse. So what it did is it limited the options your opponent had. Mm. So the game master maxed out the saving throws for pretty much every opponent that we had. So she maxed out her power rank. And then he went higher than what was the campaign limit. Hmm. So her character wound up being useless. And it's just like, 
uh, from that point on, she hated saving throws for a superhero campaign. She's like, in the comics, the power just works. Yeah. Unless the opponent has a counter. If the opponent doesn't have a counter, there's no roll. No. Yeah. yeah. Uh, take care. Yeah. Take care. Yeah, we have uh, one of our viewers going away. Uh, yeah. I was no, like, no one said anything. What? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Hi, uh, you know, Hi, thank you. Um, so, Anya, um, I'm curious about the pro GMing thing. Uh, yeah. I, I, I run games a lot, but it's usually mm -hmm. just my friends are for free or for the podcast, that kind of thing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I do know we have a, somebody coming to our convention who's going to run a panel on becoming pro GM and that, like managing it. Uh, I'm, mm -hmm. What advice would you have for someone who's thinking about doing that or any pitfalls to avoid? Um, so I run uh, my pro GM games on this website called Start Playing Games. Um, I really like it because all of the money and scheduling, well, I schedule things on the website and then people can sign up for my games from that. But all of the money stuff is taken out of my hands because mm -hmm. it is all of the players, they put their credit cards on their files and then it automatically pays out on their credit card when they are in a game with me. I do not have to ask them for money. Mm -hmm. I yeah. do not have to say, hey, you are two weeks overdue on this. Please pay me for my games. Right. Um, like it's out of my hands so that I can focus on running my games. Uh, so I really love that. Um, I know a number of pro GMs who are like, they run their things through like Kofi or like just having people PayPal them, things like yeah. that. Um, I think that this is much more secure and uh, they take a 10% cut, but that also goes to the running of the website and uh, doing ad promotions and things like that. I think it's fully worth it. Mm -hmm. um, but I generally, so I have two campaigns that I am running every single, nearly every single week. I didn't run them yesterday because I was at the convention, but I have a Serenity RPG that I run and I have a D&D &D 5e game that I run. Uh, and beyond that, I'm running a ton of one shots all over the place. So uh, the game tomorrow is a one shot. Uh, and it's uh, just a bunch of random players who have all said, hey, I have a free uh, afternoon or morning or whatever. And I want to, I want to play this game. It sounds fun. So. So how many sessions would you say you run in a week on average? It depends on the season because there are seasons for pro GMs and that's not something that people really think about. Uh, so for example, um, I'm officially as of like yesterday, I am one year a pro GM. Okay. I have been doing this for exactly a year now. And um, September is a slow season because people are going back to school because uh, any number of things, uh, summer is over, kids are, are busy, whatever, like life happens. Uh, and so it was very slow. Uh, and now things are starting to ramp up again. Uh, but then in December, things will slow down again. And so everything ebbs and flows and you have to take that into account. Um, but uh, I'd say on general, I run probably five uh, to 10 sessions a week. Okay. Oh my God. Yeah. that's Because yeah. <laughs> I love running games, but I yes. just don't know that I could, you know, like I, we have a it Patreon, a and for a while, we had levels where I would run games for people, and it became mm -hmm. so stressful for me yeah. mm -hmm. uh, that I just worry about my mental well, state. Here's the thing. Um, so for Monster of the Week, um, I and I, I have this note in my one-shot Monster of the Week uh, listings that says, if you have been in a game with me before, please tell me what you played with me, uh, because I will repeat the, the sessions that I uh, run. So there's this one module that I've run probably 20, 30 times at this point, and it's different every single time, which is part of what I love about Monster of the Week, because what happens is 100% informed by what the players want to do mm -hmm. and how they interact with the world. And so um, sometimes there's like very little prep involved. I ran, uh, not Monster of the Week, but I ran this D&D uh, 5e game um, 
last week and it was a full table five players and it's a module that i've run maybe 10 times at this point i didn't actually open the pdf for an hour <laughs> I had the beginning memorized and I got to that hour mark and I said, hang on, hang on guys. I need to actually open the PDF now. And they were, they were shocked that I like, wasn't referencing it yet. Right. Right. So the, the, the thing that prevented me from trying to be a professional uh, DM besides the anxiety um, mm, yeah, that is way. like, there's the, there's the games that I want to run. The trick is mm -hmm. how do you get the players to play the games that you want to run? Because like you said, 5e and Firefly, yeah. those are two very popular franchises. Uh, mm -hmm. But like if I wanted to do something like, say, for example, New Edo, uh, if people haven't heard about it, how do you get them to come in? That is very tricky. Um, so I, the ones that I run are 5e, Monster of the Week, mm -hmm. and Serenity. Uh, and there are two systems. There's the Firefly system and Serenity system, and they are different things. The mm -hmm. Serenity system came out in 2005 when the movie came out. Anyway, um, I, uh, anyway, yes. Yeah. So um, I've also tried to run uh, Glitter Hearts, uh, mm -hmm. and that one I've I run I two that. games, and that's it. It's great. I adore the game. I've played it on stream on Girls Run These Worlds, and we played as mermaids, very uh, H2O uh kind of thing like you touch water you turn into your mermaid form nice. um that was a six-part series absolutely adored it it's really hard to run in a pro gm setting uh especially because there aren't as many people who want to play uh magical girls mm. So the more niche you get, the harder it can be to find players for it. So I uh, genuinely, what I end up doing is I will post listings. I have, because I'm in Germany and most of my players are in the US, I will set games at like 6 a.m. my time and that's 9 p.m. on the West Coast US. Um, and I'm an early riser, so it's fine. Uh, but I will do like a morning slot, an afternoon slot, and an evening slot. And I just like do a wide variety of all of my different games. And then whatever people sign up for, they sign up for. And awesome. I will uh, schedule whatever I can whenever I can. Do you mind asking uh, how much or mind sharing how much people pay? Like what is it per session oh, yeah. or per campaign? Yeah. So players pay uh, 25 bucks a seat. Uh, okay. per session. Okay. Yeah. Wow. 25. That's actually pretty good. And yeah. Is that four, How five, have... six players? It depends. So uh, currently the game for tomorrow, hey, if anyone's watching and wants to play, uh, uh, I only have two players uh, currently in that uh, game. Uh, I do minimum two players and uh, maximum five. Um, anything more than five and people don't get their time to shine, and shine in my opinion. So okay. uh, better to run a game. Three is my preferred. Like if I'm just playing for funsies, mm -hmm. I want three players. To me, that's the perfect. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can go. Yeah. And see, it depends. Five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, how many hours uh, per session? Um, I tend to go for three to three and a half. Anything more than three and a half, and I start to personally fall asleep. Mm. <laughs> or burn out, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just I get too tired. Um, but that's kind of the sweet spot, and that's with like a 10 minute break in the middle as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, I got yeah, table, I, I do learned... five to eight. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, one thing that I've learned with pro GMing is um, at the beginning, I wasn't, if I only had two players, I would just say, hey, let's reschedule or cancel the game. Uh, I lost out on a lot of uh, players because of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I'm, I'm more comfortable in my GMing and I'm more than happy to run for two players. Uh, sometimes that those games run a little bit shorter, but that's just because they're only two players. Yep. So, to get a lot so more done. there's not much you can do about that. So for the one shots, you know, is in general, is your player base people who are just like, I want to try that game. And so they're, they're finding the, Monster of the Week, or is it someone who's like, I love Monster of the Week, no one else runs it, so I'm kind of like, are you getting repeat people who played the same Monster of the Week with you? 
I get repeat people uh, fairly often. Uh, one of the players for tomorrow actually is a repeat player. Uh, so I just said, hey, which one is it? And it was the one that I've run 20 to 30 times. So I have plenty other games. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, like I have the Tome of Mysteries right here. Uh, but I've also written two of my own. So I'm probably going to run one of the ones I've written, actually. Um but uh, sometimes it's just, um, hey, I have a free morning or I have a free evening and I was just looking for a game to play. Um, anytime a video game comes out, like Baldur's Gate, uh, I, for a solid two weeks after that video game came out, had people saying, hey, I really liked Baldur's Gate and I wanted to try D&D, so I signed up for your games. I actually had someone who signed up for a Monster of the Week game thinking it was D&D, and I was like... Mm. No, but you'll still have fun with it. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and it worked out. Do you have any games that are concurrent? Like, you know, uh, you know, you, you play every week with the same number of players, with the same people? Yeah, so that's those two campaigns that I have on uh, Sundays. So for a while, I had a Monster of the Week campaign, but scheduling is the uh, big bad. Yes. Yep. yep. It's horrible. And so that game ended up fizzling out. But I did get it to a nice conclusion point before uh, one of our players started his new job that made it impossible to play the game. Gotcha. Um, you know. Now, do you use a VTT, like Roll20 or whatever? Um, I use Play Roll. Uh, they're still in beta mode, I believe, but, you know, um, allowing players. Um, I actually started out as one of their affiliate uh, dungeon masters. And so they were like, it was a two month program. And so they, uh, they pay the GMs for getting players to sign up for their game rooms, uh, sign up on the website uh, just to get like people trying out the website. That was for uh, two months and I fell in love with the website. And so I just kept using it and then they just kept paying me. And I was like, okay, great. I can't say hard. Yeah, I'll I'll take it. I won't so, say no. Because and it's one thing genuinely I, a great thing. I love it. Because one thing I run into, like uh, you know, I see the advertisements a lot in the Facebook groups mm-hmm. that I'm in, and usually there's the like, this is what I offer, and a lot mm-hmm. of times it's you know like uh, very immersive, you know, tokens mm-hmm. and blah blah blah. And I don't like any of that. Like I like yeah. theater of the mind, and when I yep. play, I mm-hmm. only want to play theater of the mind. So I'm always like, well, yep. that, that's that's the opposite of what I want. So I'm I'm curious. Mm-hmm. If you put a theater of the mind game on there, are you going to have a harder time finding players than you would with tokens and maps and such? I sometimes use maps. Um, I use them when they are necessary, but like sometimes, especially with, uh, with fighting mechanics, it gets a little bit tricky. Um, But even um, I'd say like none of my monster of the week games uh, I use maps, none of them. Um, and uh, my Wild Beyond the Witchlight game, I do tend to have to use them just because if something happens. Uh, but more often than not, I'm using it to show images and uh, give point of reference because there are um, a number of players who can't uh, visualize things easily in their minds. It's just you're describing words and it's a blank slate yes. in their heads. And so, um, especially like with my Wild Beyond the Witchlight campaign, I have all of the beautiful artwork from the book because I have uh, the game on D&D Beyond. Um, and so I will just pull those images and I'll show them, hey, here, this is what this tag looks like or mm. what have you. Um, but yeah, so, um, and play role is like, there is... Uh, there are maps and things like that. It's a little bit uh, less clunky uh, is the best way to describe it. It's very simplified compared to things like Foundry and Roll20 and stuff like that. Like there's no snapping to grid. There's no measuring. Um, everyone can move everyone's tokens. Everyone can accidentally delete everyone's tokens. Yeah. Um, but I know that they are working on improving the map system. Um, so that's their current active project that they're doing on the website. Uh, but for me personally, what I use VTTs for, it's perfect. Okay. Well, I appreciate yeah, you sharing I, that with me. I don't think it's, I'm ready for the career, but I do think maybe mm-hmm. some extra money because I, I think I'm really good yeah. at running games. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I'd love to run Star Trek on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were talking about uh, using uh, images and stuff to help uh, people visualize stuff. Uh, one of our artists has uh, aphantasia. She can't mm-hmm. picture mm-hmm. things in her mind. 
So I can just imagine. Yeah, and she's a like she's an artist. She did uh, yeah. like some of the cover work for me. So I, I was just like, mm -hmm. okay. But it, as long as you can give her like visual examples and, and describe yeah. things well, then she could use it. But like, mm -hmm. if you just said, like, yeah, so you know, picture this, she'd be like, I can't. Yes. Yeah. I have a weird version of that with like engineering stuff. Like, mm -hmm. like I, I can like theater of the mind. I, I, I run that great. But a lot of times, if someone says like, you know, can you can you build a thing? Like I will build it terribly and then go, mm -hmm. oh, okay, now I see what you're talking about. But I can't conceptualize it to begin with. I have to have a mm -hmm. some sort of prototype, no matter how rudimentary it is, before I can then take that next step. I don't know if there's a word for that or just I'm dumb. Uh, but, yeah. Well, I don't know. It makes me think of like when I'm writing my games, I can't. It's that evil blank page, you know? So mm -hmm. I actually do my layout while I'm writing. Mm. And um, like with uh, the Apothecary's Apprentice, I bought the stock art pack from my uh, uh, my artist who also did the, uh, the play test on stream. Um, and uh, I actually just started putting in the artwork into the game early so that I could have that mental moment to be like oh, okay this is what i want here this is what i want to describe here um and it really helped me to be able to write things that i actually uh wrote quite a bit that was inspired specifically by the artwork that i was putting in mm. being like oh yes this is really beautiful i love this oh this looks very dangerous okay yeah i had like with my art uh for action 12 cinema like I knew I wanted it to be black and white and it, it was supposed mm -hmm. to look like storyboards. Like the, the idea yeah. was that all the art was essentially a storyboard. And I ended up, I, I did a bunch of like casting calls for artists, but I ended up going with two people I knew uh, fairly mm -hmm. well. They, they, they knew what I wanted, I guess. But yeah. when it came time to do the art, I would be like, here's the list of all the tropes. Cause tropes are a big thing in, in my game. Like we have like all the tropes about the, you know, cool guys don't look at explosions and that kind of stuff. And I said, just pick your favorite trope and then give me a version of it. Like I didn't say I want two people in their armor. Mm -hmm. Cause like, I have no idea. I just want, I want yeah. to be able to look at that and go, this is the trope you're referencing. And beyond that, they all they had full reign to do whatever they wanted. I think like maybe one mm -hmm. or two, um, I had them, um, just like minor things like, Oh, could you do this or do that type of thing? Cause I just couldn't visualize to begin yeah. with what I wanted. I had to start with something. Mm -hmm. so. But anyway. So uh, when we end the stream, would you be able to give yeah. us some links about your, uh, uh, the, uh, pro GM stuff? Yep. We're, we're um, going to definitely want links. Yeah. Am I able to post links in the chat? Because I saw stars when someone tried to post a link previously. Um, uh, I was thinking that actually post it to us in Discord. That way we can actually share okay. it out and we can also uh, present it uh, on the YouTube when we put it on YouTube. Yeah. Absolutely. Hang yeah, on. I threw a couple second. in there as well uh, to the convention and to the, my Action 12 Cinema because you can still buy it and I'm, we'll ship it out when and the PDF is available now, type of thing. So yeah, we should have a couple of mine in the, the Discord. Yeah, I'm curious about that, uh, about that game because uh, I remember one uh, in the 90s called, it came from the Late, 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 Late Show, uh, where you played actors who were going into uh, like the old, you know, late night show uh, television shows, uh, horror usually, um, and then that was the adventure, and then you'd go into the next one, which would be a different story, and you're mm. playing the same character through all of these. Yeah, this is a it's basically it's a one shot machine. Like, like it's kind of like I say, you know, if you want to Fast and Furious it and have eleven movies, you can, but there's no advancement. Like you already start as action movie heroes. You're already already have everything that you need. You don't really improve other than care, uh, relationships can change and develop over time. Uh, but yeah, it's my favorite thing is just completely gymless. You don't have to like think about anything. You just roll some d12s and it lays out the movie for you, and then you get to play pretend with your friends. From the kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, neat. yeah so i went ahead and i dropped a couple of links into the uh discord server into the the chat that i for some reason can never find yeah. it literally takes me like five minutes or more every time i go into the server to find that channel and i don't know why uh what you do is you can go into the club babylon ch uh, channel hashtag the channel you want to look for and it'll give you the link and then you just jump from oh. there Nice. Yeah, but if I don't remember the name of it. <laughs> oh, okay, then that could be a problem, yes. <laughs> yes. Channel's <laughs> Yep. 
But anyway, um, so it's nearing on 11 p.m. here, so I do need to head yeah, on. Yeah, I'm thinking we should probably wrap up around here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, actually works out well for me as well. But I've had a great time. I'm so thankful yeah. for you giving me the opportunity to come on and chat. It was very nice to meet you, Anya. Yeah, I was glad yeah, that you guys too. showed up. Um, as I always say, <laughs> uh, once you're here, uh, you have an open invitation to any future one. It's like Olive Garden when you're here, your family. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> me channel, you channel. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, if you're if you're overseas, keep an eye out. We do uh, we do a couple of these uh, earlier geek and greets uh, mm -hmm. a couple times a year. So because uh, if you need us to to run a little early, we can. Yeah, yeah because I cannot I cannot do middle of the night. I've done two uh, panels that were like two a.m. my time, and I it, I can't do that anymore. It's too much. Yeah. So you're you're a morning bird, not a night owl. Yeah, like uh, if I could go to bed at like nine thirty, ten o'clock every night, I would be very happy. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, uh, my partner's the opposite. She's the night owl. Yeah, mm. I used to be, and I have in my old age, I have turned into a, a early to bed, early or to rise kind of person. I don't know what happened. It's weird, but yeah. Mm. For me, it's as long as I can go to sleep at some time. I'm here. <laughs> okay, so well, nice having you guys here. Yeah, uh, yeah. We'll uh, hopefully uh, get to see you again in the future. Definitely, and just to do do a quick promo since it is in two days, just as a reminder. So the Apothecary's Apprentice, mm -hmm. uh, it's on Kickstarter. Uh, you can click on that pre-launch, notify me on launch thing, um, and there's. The, that well, it's backwards. That won't work. Anyway, um, yeah. So Actually, it wasn't uh, backwards. Oh, wasn't it wasn't. Backwards. It was no. backwards for me. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Click on that. It works for two more days because I accidentally did a dynamic QR code. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Lesson <laughs> learned, right? Yeah. Lesson yeah. learns. But hey, it it is active through day one of the Kickstarter. That's the important thing. Um. But yeah, it, you're a potion maker's apprentice trying to uh, survive a week without the apothecary uh, and helping the customers uh, who come by and doing a bunch of world building as well. Very nice. So, yeah. Uh, and uh, my quick plugs, I'm at the RPG Academy pretty much everywhere. We're primarily still a podcast. We have a variety of shows, including GM Theory. Uh, we have some live play. We have the show and tell, which is where we bring on creators who are doing things. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Detention, which is like a loose format talk show. It's a lot of fun, a lot of silliness. Uh, we have streams. We have YouTube updates. Basically, if, if there's anything I said tonight you thought was interesting or funny, then there's like a thousand episodes of, of me you can go listen to. And then come see me in Dayton, Ohio in November. It's a great little con with a terrible name. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, the funny thing is, I just looked at the link to that, and I did look at the name, and I was like, man, that's an awful name. Uh, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because you're uh, right. When you see it, your mind automatically just throws an R in there. It's like, it's yep. Arcadicon. It's like, yep. no, no, he said it's not. <laughs> yeah, Calgary had uh, confusion. Ah. Mm. Makes sense. I was we a special do... guest at Conjuration. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. If I were to change the name, it would have to be something with a D12. Like we would have to find a way to incorporate mm. that into it. And the the problem is, if there is a problem, is that there is another convention. It's a one day con, or sorry, it's a two day con. Uh, it's called Daycon. So it's like Dayton Convention. It's like uh. perfect name, but it already exists. We're very friendly. We like each other. So there's no competition, but obviously I can't take their name. Uh, and yeah. it's like, it's like the best version of the name. So I don't know, but we usually do themes every year. We kind of didn't this year for various reasons, but we talked about doing a noir theme just mm. because it's no R. So we would say no R, but it would be no R to like highlight the fact yeah. that there's no R in there. So, well, if you're talking D12s, you could call it uh Dodecacon. I was thinking about something like that. Already taken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure there is. Yeah. That one. yeah. Uh, oh, well. But anyways, but yeah, I'm going to go up here on you, go to sleep, have some fun, yep. gentlemen. Thank you so much for having me on. And okay. uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll see you on the interwebs at some point in time. Absolutely. Yeah, yep, for sure. Yeah. I'm Lolly on cosplay everywhere. Uh, just right. one thing for our viewers. Uh, tomorrow night, we're going to be doing a six hour uh, live stream for Halloween. We're going to be playing uh, Keep Six. Um, and then we're also going to be playing uh, Fox Magic. Uh, 
uh, House on Kamori Hill is the name mm -hmm. of that one. So uh, join us tomorrow night. Uh, starts at, uh, oh, what time are we starting? That's probably good <laughs> to know. Yes, that would be good to know. Uh, I'm not the one running this uh, sec uh, section, so I have no idea. Uh, I just run the company. I don't know what's going on. It starts at a time. And we'll lay it out on uh, Twitter. Yeah, we'll get it on Twitter for everybody. And Facebook and everything else, yeah. yeah. All right. If you, if you two want to run something there. <laughs> not me. I, 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 I could hear the nope. Nope. <laughs> Well, I See. I always do lines and veils and uh, session zero and all of that. And there's no time for that. No. Yeah. No uh, luckily, saying. we're doing we're doing pre gen characters uh, for both games. Mm. So. Yeah. Nice. All right then. Well, take care, everyone. Uh, thanks right. for uh, coming. Everybody have a good night. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Bye. Good night.